Thanks to everybody for, uh, for coming back. Uh, this is day two of our Pathways to Prevention conference uh, on reducing disparities in utilization and outcomes from preventive interventions. Uh, this is going to be fun today. Uh, it's a serious topic, but uh, we have a lot to do uh, in the next five or so hours. Uh, a lot of literature to discuss, and we have great speaker panels and a great keynote speaker to close. Um, I'm Tim Carey. Good morning. Hope everybody got a good night's sleep. Uh, just to reprise the ground rules, because some of you may not have been here yesterday. So we will have two key questions for discussion today, one on HIT and its role in reducing disparities, and another in the role of health systems and systems interventions. Uh, in reducing health disparities. Um, we will hear from our colleagues at OHSU who conducted the systematic review at the beginning of each component, and then we will have several speakers to give a feel for what are the research gaps and what is the research context for these issues as we discuss future research needs in this area. So um, for those of you looking on online, um, this is being teleconferenced. Uh, we are interested in your views, uh, views of other researchers, views of folks who aren't here, views of the public, patients, and advocates. Uh, for the online folk, if you could send via email or Twitter, uh, we will uh, address questions here during the session as we can. And similar to yesterday, after each component is done, if you could line up at the, uh, the, the panel, we'll ask questions first, our evidence panel, and then we will go to left mic, right mic, or right mic, left mic, mic and uh, answer questions in order. Please, your questions or comments are limited to two minutes each. Um, and I have to be pretty strict about that so we can keep to time. Um, thank you. I think that's the ground rules. Uh, and our next up will be a video vignette uh, and message on the importance of health equity and preventive services to NCI from Dr. Croyle, who's the Director of Division of Cancer Control at NCI. Take it, Dr. Croyle. Health equity is important to the National Cancer Institute because the research that we lead, support, and conduct is really designed to inform strategies to reduce the incidence of mortality uh, due to cancer in our population. To the degree that some populations uh, have disproportionate burden because that evidence isn't reaching them either through policy or clinical practice, we want to make sure that we're providing the right evidence through the best research to reduce those disparities. Well, as NIH's largest institute, we have a special responsibility to address issues of health inequity. And we do this through applications of research, but also through the utilization of our extensive research infrastructure, 70 NCI designated cancer centers, a major national clinical trials program, uh, a breadth of epidemiological cohorts and intervention studies. And by bringing all of these resources and tools to bear, we feel we can make significant progress on reducing health inequities by the generation of new evidence, but also by implementing the best evidence we currently have available. So in the area of cancer control, we have incredible opportunities to significantly reduce the burden of cancer in underserved communities. Uh, and there are some really compelling examples of this. Cervical cancer is a great example. There are significant disparities in cervical cancer incidence and mortality. But now we have a cancer prevention vaccine, the HPV vaccine. If we can get people vaccinated, we can prevent cervical cancer. Similarly, in colorectal cancer, uh, we know that we have the tools, again, the screening modalities that can allow us to detect colorectal cancer early, but also to prevent the progression of colorectal cancer. That's really essential because what it means is that if we can improve the delivery and uptake of these preventive services, we know we can have a significant impact on reducing cancer mortality. We 
can make tremendous progress in reducing the most common cancers, the most common causes of cancer death, by focusing on strategies that address the biggest risk factors, the biggest drivers of cancer in America. That includes tobacco use, which still accounts for a third of all cancer deaths in the United States. That includes colorectal cancer, where we have effective screening strategies. And that also applies to cancers like cervical cancer, where we have an effective cancer prevention vaccine. By employing the best evidence, by conducting additional research and developing more effective strategies, we can have a significant impact on reducing health inequity in the United States. Good morning. Um, I'm Amy Cantor. I'm at, um, from the Evidence-Based Practice Center. I uh, wanted to introduce myself. I'm an associate professor of medical informatics and clinical epidemiology, as well as family medicine and obstetrics and gynecology, and I'm going to talk today about key question four, which focuses on health information technology interventions. Um, so let's see where the pointer is. Here we go. I have nothing to disclose. And again, wanted to reintroduce the Evidence-Based Practice Center team, a few of our members of our team are here today, and the others are tuning in. So to start with key question four, I want to read it out loud so we can really be clear about what we're focusing on uh, for this question. Key question four is looking at the effectiveness of health information technology and digital enterprises to improve the adoption, implementation, and dissemination of evidence-based preventive services in settings that serve populations adversely affected by disparities. Important to understand for this particular question is looking at the criteria that are unique to the key question. As with the entire review, we're looking at populations who are adversely affected by disparities and the providers serving those populations. Uh, interventions for this key question are looking at types of interventions that use a form of technology to automatically identify or directly interact with patients to improve preventive services. Our comparisons are, are the types of studies that look at intervention compared with no intervention or usual care, or looking at populations who are adversely affected by disparities versus those who are not. Uh, the outcomes include intermediate outcomes such as access to preventive services like screening rates, uh, and clinical outcomes also include incidence, morbidity, mortality, burden of disease, and others that are relevant to those clinical health outcomes as well. The study designed for key question four for these types of interventions include controlled clinical trials and prospective cohort studies. So what are health information technology interventions and digital enterprises? What we mean here, and wanted to give you some example of the types of interventions that are included, are things like automated text message reminders, interactive electronic kiosks to randomize patients and deliver interventions where the patient would potentially walk up to an interactive tool or utilize that themselves, or multimodal interventions that might include a technological component. So what I mean by that is that it could be a website or an interactive voice response system as part of an intervention. And some of the other elements of the intervention may not be technology-based, but in order uh, to be included in this particular question, there has to be a, a technology component. We look at studies that utilize electronic health records, but they have to be used to automate or trigger messages. It doesn't include interventions that use the HR to review or manually identify patients. There are also studies that look at telemedicine versus telephone counseling, so that digital interface between uh, providers and patients as well. Um, and for key question four, there are seven randomized control trials that were included for this uh, question. The preventive services covered similar to some of our other questions, the majority of which cover cancer screening, uh, three of colorectal cancer screening, two for breast cancer, one for cervical cancer. There was one study of smoking cessation and one for management of obesity. And the populations included in these seven studies include vulnerable, low-income, safety net clinic patients, rural, Native Alaskan, American Indian, Latino women, and some other minorities as well. 
As a reminder, as we move through the evidence, we use grades for strength of evidence as well as applicability, and you'll see these in each of the summary tables that we'll move through. Um, the high grade for evidence means that we're very confident that there's a true effect for the intervention, whereas for low, we're more limited in the way that we, uh, in our confidence in terms of what the evidence shows, and then we need more evidence for those particular outcomes. Uh, where there's insufficient evidence, there's either no evidence or no confidence, meaning that maybe it was a poor quality study uh, or that there aren't any studies for that particular outcome. And then applicability also has the same level, high, moderate, and low. Looking at low uh, applicability would mean that maybe the results could apply to selected populations or the study was conducted in a small uh, population, not necessarily representative of the larger community in the U.S., rather than something that would achieve high applicability, those studies would apply widely to U.S. practice. So I'm going to start with the evidence for technolo uh, technology interventions around colorectal cancer screening. Uh, the first study utilized an electronic decision aid with patient-ordered tests and follow-up messages. And so what this study did is they used a mobile patient technology for health. It was uh, like an iPad. They actually used an iPad to deliver a brief decision aid, let patients order their own screening tests, and then send automatic electronic messages to help them with screening and support. And this increased screening rates in low-income patients. The strength of the evidence as well as applicability was low. Um, this was a study in a specific population in a community-based pr primary care practice in North Carolina, um, but certainly demonstrated that for this group of vulnerable patients who were described by the study as low income, uh, this was an effective intervention. The next study was also a trial that used an EHR to identify patients and then automate telephone calls, and this increased screening rates as well in low-income patients. So the EHR was used to identify the patients who were past due for screening. Uh, the intervention occurred over the course of six months and included letters, and then there were four automated telephone calls that occurred over that intervention period. Uh, there were also some other multimodal interventions, but the technology piece was the automated telephone call. And this increased screening at a year for colorectal cancer, and that included for colonoscopy, FIT, or FOBT in, in this group of low-income patients. The last study that evaluated an intervention for colorectal cancer screening used text messages in addition to usual phone calls and mailings. And no differences were seen when they compared usual calls versus automated text messages. There were three text message reminders that were sent about a month apart to a population of Alaska Native and American Indian patients, and there was no effect there. The next group of studies evaluated uh, the effect of technology for breast and cervical cancer screening. Overall, none of these studies were particularly effective, but I'll walk through each of the components so we can get a sense of what they were doing. For breast cancer screening, an EHR was used to identify patients uh, past due for screening, and uh, this is, you heard the similar, it's the same study, but also uh, done for colorectal cancer and breast cancer screening um, in the same population of patients. Um, and they used the, the automated telephone calls. There were four calls for that, and this was not an effective intervention in terms of getting patients to increase their screening rates. Another study, another trial, used uh, EHR-triggered reminder letters for direct referral to screening. Um, and this was done in Detroit, Michigan, in a low-income population. And the EHR triggered a letter to visit the primary care physician for a mammography referral versus just getting um, another arrangement that was not electronic-based. And after looking at screening at one year, there was no effect among this population of low-income patients. For cervical cancer screening, there were electronic education mod models, and so there was a one-time interactive model uh, with, at a touchscreen kiosk to educate patients about cervical cancer screening, um, which included knowledge and risk, risk factors, screening procedures, um, and information about the test itself. And the outcome was a PAP test within six months of receiving the intervention. And there was no effect for those receiving the intervention versus those who didn't. Uh, this trial was done among low-income Latina women in California.
The next group of studies looked at smoking cessation and obesity management. There was one study of smoking cessation, and that was conducted among rural low-income uh, patients. And they looked at how telemedicine would work for counseling. And so the patients were um, received counseling sessions through the clinic. They were kind of moved into a separate space, and there was an automated connect, uh, a connection to a telemedicine counselor. Uh, so it was like a virtual visit, essentially. And they found that there was no difference in quit rates among this low-income rural patients. And so they looked at smoking cessation at six months for telemedicine versus telephone encounters, and there were no difference in quit rates for that particular population. The one study of obesity management looked at behavioral change counseling with a web or a telephone-based patient self-monitoring in progress. And the population included, as described by the study, racial and ethnic minorities in three urban community centers uh, in Boston. And this was a two-year uh, multimodal intervention that included education about behavior change goals, patient self-monitoring, feedback, and the real-time feedback came through a website or an interactive voice response system, and counseling and calls were delivered by community health educators. There were optional group sessions, so there were definitely a lot of components there, um, but the telemedicine, or the, the technology piece was using the website and using the interactive voice response system. And they did find um, mod modestly decreased BMI in the intervention group over 24 months. It was about 0.38 uh, was the, the difference there, and that was statistically significant. Um, and there was decreased BMI for the intervention group over the 24-month period in this group of ethnic and racial minorities. So to summarize all of the, all seven health technology uh, interventions, um, overall, there was some mixed results, but m m the majority of them were not effective. Uh, for the intervention using the electronic decision aid, follow-up reminders, and self-ordered tests, this was effective for colorectal cancer screening. Automated text message reminders were not effective for colorectal or breast cancer screening. A multimodal intervention that utilized automatic telephone calls was effective for colorectal cancer screening, but not for breast cancer screening. Automated letter reminders uh, were not effective for breast cancer screening. Utilization of an interactive touchscreen kiosk with educational models was not effective for cervical cancer screening in low-income Latinas. Telemedicine-delivered counseling was ineffective for smoking cessation. And multimodal intervention using a web platform or an interactive voice response system to monitor progress and receive real-time feedback was effective for obesity management. So there are some limitations of our, our results here. Um, the number, quality, and applicability of studies varied. There were seven studies of uh, health information technology. And many of the patient populations that we know about that would be included uh, and considered at risk for disparities were not studied in these studies. Uh, patient populations may not have been clearly defined, just an overarching description of low income, but maybe we didn't know some of the other uh, nuance there for those populations. There were a lack of standardized interventions across all of the interventions, so they were essentially there were some one-offs where we saw how an intervention worked in one population, but that doesn't mean that it may not work in another or that it would work in a different population, so we want to be cautious there. Um, and it's unclear how the health information technology components themselves impacted the outcome when we have some of those multimodal interventions. So if we could drill down on how that particular intervention affected when we have a kind of a multi-level uh, inter intervention. And in general, evidence was lower insufficient. So just a lack of studies and small numbers of participants in many of them. Future research needs for health information technology. Um, studies that incorporate health information technology to improve access and expand preventive services and target populations. We started to talk about this a bit yesterday when we were thinking about um, implementing technology and utilizing EHRs. And there are certainly many opportunities to kind of find places where we could look at elements of the EHR using them in an automated way. Um, telemedicine is interesting as uh, patients, when we're thinking about rural populations, thinking about the effect of reaching hard-to-reach populations by way of interactive 
um, virtual visits? Could those be effective in different situations? They weren't effective for this particular uh, group of studies, but certainly there are lots of opportunities to study technology, and um, some of that's in the works. Studies of additional preventive services, those that were not evaluated by the seven studies that we included, included lung cancer screening, high blood pressure, type 2 diabetes screening, aspirin use for cardiovascular disease and colorectal cancer, and healthful diet and physical activity for cardiovascular uh, disease prevention. So key messages for key question four. Um, these health information technology interventions varied widely in their approach and their components. Some of them were really simple. Um, some use it, used automated messaging. Some used text message reminders and the multimodal interventions and some of the ways that we could sort out how effective the health information technology was in those multimodal interventions. Uh, most of the interventions were ineffective, although most studies were small and inconclusive. So that's important to consider when we're looking at um, some of the number of patients included, the types of populations that were included, and even elements of the uh, technology. Um, as those new technologies emerge, we can think of different, maybe different ways to evaluate them. And then in general, few studies have been done. Um, we're at this uh, precipice, essentially, of when we're, there's so many ways that technology is being utilized in society, and how can we optimize that in medicine and in community health and public health? And it seems like there's many opportunities, but certainly we need to evaluate them on the patient care level. Um, so that would be an important message. Um, and then limited application to other populations or clinical settings. So really looking to evaluate how this can be adopted in multiple settings in different types of populations um, and in, in for different purposes. So those are generally uh, the main messages for the health information technology. Um, our full evidence report is available currently online, and we welcome comments for that um, and suggestions, certainly. Uh, we are doing an updated search. Our search from this particular draft of the report went uh, up through August of 2018, so we're in the process of updating that, and we're looking forward to maybe some new studies that are coming out about health information technology and how that relates to uh, preventive services. So thank you. I'm Gary Bennett, uh, a professor at Duke University, where I lead uh, Duke Digital Health, um, which is a, a research center that's wholly invested in trying to look at the impact of digital health technologies on um, improvement in health outcomes in medically vulnerable populations. Um, most of our work, before I move on, let me talk about my disclosures. I have a few. I work with Weight Watchers and Interactive Health on their science advisory boards. Uh, I'm Hold Equity and Coyus Health, and I serve on the board of directors of Girl Trek, a nonprofit organization um, invested in physical activity promotion among black women. Um, you know, one of the, the downside risks of having been subject to lots of media attention about uh, the obesity epidemic is that you can habituate us to, this, to its magnitude. Uh, and the fact is that we have 93 million Americans with obesity and very few treatment solutions that have, are really available to them today. Um, the problem is particularly uh, daunting, I would say, in medically vulnerable communities where 7 out of 10 uh, folks in socioeconomically disadvantaged groups, racial ethnic minority groups, and in rural populations um, have the condition. So it's not just that folks in medically vulnerable communities are more likely to have obesity, but they're more likely to have the chronic diseases that travel along with it. They drive health costs, and they are less likely to receive treatment. In fact, most Americans don't receive treatment in the primary care setting for obesity uh, at present, and those who have the highest risk of obesity are the least likely to receive uh, that treatment. And so the, the additional problem, the one that we spend most of our time contending with, is that even when treated, uh, patients who are medically vulnerable are dramatically less likely to be successful. Um, this is what obesity treatment looks like. Um, generally, this is often referred to in the field as gold standard obesity treatment. Um, and so what, what you can take away from this, if you're not a behavioral scientist, is that this is a lot. And it's an extraordinarily intensive course of treatment uh, that takes a lot of time and requires, uh, it's very expensive and requires a lot of patience. Uh, and so perhaps it's no surprise that consistently over the last uh, several generations, 
Um, the one consistent finding in the obesity treatment literature is uh, are essentially disparate outcomes when medically vulnerable communities are enrolled in those trials. In generally, uh, in general, you see somewhere between a third and two thirds of the weight loss effects you see in majority populations. And the problem is that the weight losses that are typically observed in medically vulnerable communities happen to be right below the level of weight loss that we believe to be clinically meaningful, uh, meaning that it make, produces positive changes in cardiometabolic parameters. And so in summary, we lack solutions for those who are at highest risk. Um, we and others have been interested in the impact of digital treatments to help to contend with this problem, both because we can do a better job personalizing them for particular patient communities and also because of the inherent dissemination uh, potential of digital technologies. And what we know about these strategies, and I, I'd argue these are probably the best studied technologies in, in the health space, uh, uh, you know, we, you see the most of the data for weight loss, um, and what we know is that in all populations, you see about five kilos weight loss at six months. That's about what we can get from digital technologies. Um, however, when you look at this in the primary care setting, where we spend most of our time, uh, you see somewhat less, uh, somewhat smaller outcomes. This was a trial by Larry Apple and colleagues at Hopkins a few years ago. Uh, it was part of a UL1 uh, network of trials. Uh, we had a trial in that network as well that you heard about just a moment ago. Uh, and what Larry and his colleagues found was uh, around four kilos of weight loss, again, this is at the clinically meaningful level, uh, at one year. And I think of this as really the maximum that you're likely to, to detect. I'll note, because I'll return to this later, that uh, he had two active treatment conditions, and one of those used digital modalities. Where we see the opportunity here is that in many of the medically vulnerable communities in which we work, uh, and, and you certainly see this nationwide, um, we, we really have new digital divides. There, there is a temptation to talk about the lack of access to uh, digital technologies in these populations, but indeed um, they are mobile first, they are mobile only, and for some groups you actually see reversed divides in as much as blacks and Hispanics are more likely to own mobile phones, uh, but more importantly to use them for a whole host of data-related purposes, those of which you see here. It's no surprise that platforms like Twitter and Facebook are disproportionately black and Latino uh, because they get most of their usage via mobile, and mobile is more likely to be used in some of these communities. Uh, so we think of that as an opportunity to contend with some of the disparities, particularly uh, that we, we observe in obesity uh, treatment, and it's been the, the basis of the work that we've been doing in our center for some time now. Um, I'm not going to spend any time on this, but just note that there's, there's a, a sizable literature about how to maximize uh, treatment outcomes using digital modalities, and, it, and you can summarize it this way. Uh, and so we try to incorporate many of these strategies in our tools. Um, but I will spend just a second telling you about our approach because it was designed specifically with many medically vulnerable populations in mind, and it, and it will serve as the basis for what I'm about to tell you next. Um, and so we created this this uh, approach about a decade ago called IOTA, the Interactive Obesity Treatment Approach, and it basically goes like this. Um, in order to lose a pound or two a week, which we think of as a healthy amount of weight loss, one must create a 500 calorie deficit each day. Um, there, that, there's some variability in that number, but it's about that. And so you can get there in a variety of ways, but one of the ways you can get there is by having people do common sense behaviors that they already know how to do. Each of these things has a calorie deficit associated with it, and if you sum them, you can get to that magic 500 calories per day. The trick is how you essentially prescribe this for patients who are different, have different characteristics. Uh, so a woman who's in her mid-30s might have a set of goals that look like this, and a man who's a little bit older might need a set of goals like that. And so the digital approaches work really well. Um, what we do with, the, with IOTA is essentially to administer surveys and to assess a range of psychological factors that... Um, that pertain to a, a patient's likelihood of engaging in treatment over the long term. Um, and so we have them fill out a little survey in the clinic, usually on an iPad. Almost none of our patients have ever used a keyboard or a mouse. Um, and uh, then we send those data into the sky, where essentially they run against algorithms, where we then reach in deep into our libraries and prescribe goals. And then we give patients those goals, and we ask them to self-monitor their adherence to those goals over, uh, over an extended time horizon. We ask them to self-monitor each and every day in some trials and weekly in other trials. They're varying uh, outcomes. I can talk, talk to you about those if you're interested. We often put devices in people's homes, and, and here I mean we put devices that connect to the cellular network in very rural areas in, in North Carolina. Uh, and then every time that they track, we provide personalized feedback. You see an example of some of our feedback here. I won't spend any time on this. Just note that we use AI-style AI strategies essentially to put together 
uh, snippets of feedback using interactive voice response or text message or whatever modality we're using. Amazon uh, Echoes now. Um, and the idea here is that we can piece these together in order to, to provide something like the kind of feedback you might receive in a counseling encounter. We then provide support because most of the data, that, at least my read of it, suggests that digital health works best when you have a human involved. Uh, and so what we, we provide uh, support of all types. Um, we, the beauty is that once we have the data, we can present the data to the care providers in the way that those care providers can best use them. So for registered dietitians in clinic who like to see a lot of data, we can give them deep dashboards that allow them to look at all kinds of patient data. But for our physician colleagues who are going to be providing counseling in very, very short amount of time, given some of the complex patient presentations, uh, we give them exactly what we need. This is very hard for you to see, but essentially it's a script that says, tell your patient who is in this study that she's lost X amount of pounds, you can reinforce that she's done well with this, and say that. And so, you know, over the last de decade and a half or so, we've, we've done about a half dozen randomized controlled trials, mostly in the obesity space. Again, you just heard about one. Um, that, uh, and we've tested this IOTA approach, and it works for a range of outcomes uh, that you see here. Um, but I thought I would just, in the spirit of this question, just talk about one of those studies, um, which is, is called TRAC, because I, I do think this illustrates the, the potential of, of utilizing uh, advanced technology in, in the primary care setting, uh, in primary care setting, set, settings that serve medically vulnerable patients. So, so we created TRAC here, and, and, and the beauty of the health system with which we work is that they already have a very robust electronic health record. Um, they're not linked with a major academic medical center. This is just their own health record. Um, and so the advantage here is that uh, we created TRAC as a technology that would integrate with their existing health record because their health record was already the a sort of single source of truth between their providers, um, meaning their, uh, their physician providers, and other ancillary care providers like registered dietitians. Um, they have not yet had strategies that allowed patients to provide data into the electronic health record uh, in any respect. So we thought it would be a, a nice opportunity to, uh, to, to drop a technology there in, in the midst of an existing system. Uh, we work very closely with Piedmont Health Services, which is a health system of, of seven community health centers in central North Carolina. Uh, their patient characteristics look like what you would imagine from other federally qualified community health centers. Um, uh, across the nation, uh, but I, I'll note that this is a very, uh, this is a reasonably rural community, um, and so keep that in mind um, when, you, when you look at some of the engagement outcomes uh, for, their, for their technology utilization. Uh, again, in, in the track trial that we just completed last year, the, you'll, you'll see demographics that look, look about what you would expect, predominantly women, um, about half black. Um, I'll, I'll note that, that this is really uh, a group of folks who were in the working poor uh, and, uh, and so that puts a whole host of constraints on their ability to engage in the care settings, to get to the care settings. So utilizing the technology offers a great opportunity to engage them uh, at a distance. Just to fast forward to the end, um, we, we see about four kilos of weight loss at 12 months, just in comparison to what you'd see as sort of a gold standard amount of weight loss in a more majority population in primary care, we get pretty close to that. So I just want to highlight that these kinds of approaches can work and can work at levels that approximate what you'd see in other populations. Um, but notably, we see very high rates of engagement using these technologies. Again, we're asking patients to use these tools uh, each and every week over the course of uh, a year or two. If you ask me how often do they do it, I'll tell you they do it a lot. Um, but we see very high rates of engagement. So if we look at um, uh, you know, sort of they're observed over expected. So how often are you using the technology when we expect you to use it every week for a year? We see 93.2% adherence to that, uh, to that recommendation. And if they track more, if they're using those technology more, technologies more, we see larger outcomes. About a third of our patients track more than 80% of the weeks, and if they do that, they lose an extra five kilos. If they weigh themselves daily, again, we have network-connected scales in the homes. If they're weighing themselves daily, meaning uh, we count this as sort of six out of seven days of the week, that's about 40% of the patients, they lose an extra seven and a half kilos. And if we combine the two and we look at all, they're doing everything we ask them to do at a high level, um, then essentially they lose almost eight kilos more. So again, as we get better at producing engagement, we, can, we might imagine that the outcomes uh, will, will get better. Again, we see weight loss similar to other primary care trials. I'll just put this here from the Apple trial earlier just to, to note that, um, that we can achieve outcomes that are similar we, that, as we see in other populations. 
But notably, uh, improving clinicians really helps. And um, this has been something that folks in my field have struggled with for some time. Many studies, including the one you heard about earlier um, that we've done, actually don't include physician providers, mostly because they uh, have so much going, so much to do in these settings. So we think about the technologies as offloading this, this clinical responsibility from them. But in fact, including providers is extraordinarily powerful. Um, at the end of this trial, uh, in a paper that just came out, we, we sort of go back and we ask patients, did your doc counsel you? on diet, exercise, weight loss, your involvement in this trial. And we see no effects if a patient says that her doctor counseled her in a generic way about diet and physical activity. But if a patient notes that her doctor did what we asked the doctor to do, which was essentially to read this little snippet and to reinforce uh, the participation in the study, they lose an extra four and a half kilos. And um, so it really, I think, points to really patient-centeredness, the importance of accountability, providing providers with the kind of data that will allow them to uh, be able to do a very, very small intervention. A tiny dose can have a reasonably sizable effect. And the, I think my key point here is that these digital therapeutics really have the possibility of working for everyone. But the question I think I was, was really asked to answer, though, is what can providers do um, to incorporate these kinds of technologies into their practice? Um, and the answer is very, very little. Um, and that is because digital technology requires infrastructure. There is sort of an, become an, an oft-noted uh, kind of a, a notion that um, the advantage of digital health technologies really is in their scalability. And that's true. But they're only scalable once they have a foundation. And it's growing that foundation that is uh, costly uh, and that requires a significant amount of thought. Any kind of digital health technology, whether it's interactive voice response, text messaging, web, mobile app, um, Amazon, that sort of vocal user interface tools, requires a robust series of servers, customer service technologies, maintenance, tech support. I was involved in a startup that uh, essentially recruited 10,000 new users within its first month. And within that first month, this is a technology essentially that required no use of Wi-Fi. Um, there were hundreds and hundreds of telephone calls asking about how to, where people were asking how to find their Wi-Fi password, right? Like, you, one has to prepare whenever you launch a digital health technology for uh, an onslaught of, of tech support and customer service concerns that are just completely out of bounds for most care settings. In large part, this is why many of our academic care centers don't have robust digital health tools just yet. Uh, and so we really will have to think about how to handle some of these concerns to see widespread implementation of these technologies in care settings that serve medically vulnerable patients. Um, it is notable here, and I, I, I want to just note this as to sort of help to bridge the conversation I hope we have later, which is that we talk a lot in the dissemination and implementation world about the impact of adopters, the people who ultimately will use these technologies. Um, I'll just note that in the digital world, the adopters are very unlikely to be the setting in which these technologies are being tested. So that is to say that very few community health centers, very few academic medical centers, very few health system actors of any type will, will be the primary adopters of the technologies that I test in my research trials. It's far more likely that the true adopters are going to be uh, folks like these. Um, many of these vendors who sell EHR tools or portal vendors or HRA tools or the weight loss startups of the world and the wellness vendors, the device makers, these are really the primary adopters of the technology and they essentially sell their foundation, uh, the platforms, into the health systems where these technologies are ultimately adopted. If we don't understand the adoption considerations of this group, then it will become very, very challenging to disseminate evidence-based technologies into any care setting, particularly those that serve medically vulnerable patients. By way of example, we conducted a trial that used our IOTA system several years ago. It was a weight gain prevention trial called SHAPE. I'm not going to spend any time on it, but just note it was an interactive voice response system, very, very inexpensive. We just published a cost-effectiveness uh, paper a few days ago um, that essentially asked people to track all those IOTA goals via telephone, and we provided personalized feedback each week. Um, and essentially, we showed that you could prevent weight gain for up to uh, four years. Um, so uh, it was successful. But if you see in the purple box the way that we test the, essentially the intervention components as they were tested in our trial, I can tell you quite clearly that there is no payer in the country who would implement that trial in the way that we tested it. Um, and and that's, that goes, that's doubly true for the vendors that are going to be the ultimate adopters of those trials. But it's not just that they're more likely to use different types of coaches and different types of technologies. They may have different expectations about provider involvement. It's also that the outcomes of interest that really drive their adoption considerations are quite different. 
For the vendors of the world, they may be focused primarily on, on return on investment, uh, and the cost uh, considerations may be more dramatic for payers. Uh, and so I think this is a, in, important for as we begin to move beyond the efficacy stage in the digital health space and start to move further down the translation continuum. We have to get more sophisticated, I think, as a field in thinking about how these, uh, these tools are ultimately adopted and, and how they really are, are, are implemented in practice. So in conclusion, let me just say that I, I think these digital treatments really can complement care in a, in a significant way. Uh, they can engage patients over the long term. When I'm on the West Coast and I talk about engagement with these technologies in low-income populations, people find it hard to believe. You have the Pokemon Go in your mind where everyone uses it for 30 days and then everyone stops using it. Our patients will use these technologies over a long-term time horizon. They don't cost much. They do scale, but they have to be designed well. And to get the dissemination piece right, I think, requires serious partnership. Um, my recommendations as it relates to this question are that we really do need to think more about moving trials, uh, particularly hybrid effectiveness efficacy trials, really into healthcare settings, particularly in the digital space. Um, it's, it's really there where we're going to find that nexus of patient, ancillary care provider, and providers where, where I think we have the greatest opportunities. We do need to start talking to vendors and to payers about the cons their actual adoption considerations and the actual outcomes that they're focused on. Um, most of our payer colleagues and many of our vendor colleagues are not interested in single outcome trials. Um, they're far more interested in, in looking at, the, at a sort of more complete whole person approach to, uh, to, to, uh, to our, our patients. Um, and, you know, I think you can use the SBIR mechanism as a model for how we could think about dissemination and implementation trials that include industry partners. Ultimately, though, I think we need to be pushing towards greater mobile adoption, and vocal user interface kinds of technologies. This is where medically vulnerable populations are. Uh, it is not just that you can reach medically vulnerable communities using mobile devices. I actually think it's the best way to reach many uh, folks in what we call hard to reach, what I call hard for us to reach populations. Um, and, uh, and so I think we need to think a lot more about mobile adoption and getting much more sophisticated with the technologies that we're using there. Thank you very much. Thanks to my team. Uh, I'm Jessica Anker. I'm a faculty member at uh, Wildcorn and Nell Medicine in New York City. And a lot of the work I'll be talking about here is both at our academic medical center and then also work done in collaboration with the Institute for Family Health, which is a federally qualified health center also in New York. Oops, sorry. Uh, I don't have any um, uh, conflicts to disclose. And uh, I want to start with uh, a, a, a little bit of a cautionary tale. Um, we are all familiar with the fact that uh, smoking rates have dropped dramatically in this country. Um, in 1953, almost half of Americans smoked, and uh, in 2017, this was, this was way down. So this is clearly a public health success story. However, I'd like to point out that at the same time, we inadvertently created a new kind of a problem. So in 1953, um, there was really no discrepancy between more educated and less educated individuals in terms of their smoking rate. Um, however, more recently, we see that people with college education and above, uh, hardly any of them actually smoke, as opposed to more than a third of people with uh, high school education or below. So the success story of smoking cessation is one in which we inadvertently created a health disparity. Uh, the reason I'm here in the information technology panel is that um, many of us working in this space are a bit worried that information technology could in fact be a new example of uh, uh, good intentions, um, but ones that create a disparity when, where there was none before. So I don't need to tell this audience that we know that people with uh, fewer resources definitely have worse health. Um, but. I do want to point out that those with, fewer, with less resources are also slower to adopt new technologies. This is something that's been known since the mid-20th century when Everett Rogers studied uh, uh, farming communities and who was likely to adopt new strains of corn. And we see that early adopters of any new technology are likely to be the best educated and the most affluent people who have enough of a financial cushion that they can take a risk on something new without it, it uh, uh, causing a disaster if it doesn't work out. Later adopters tend to be uh, less affluent. They don't have that financial ability to take a risk on something new. They also tend to uh, be slower to learn about new technologies because of smaller social networks and, and lower education. Uh, this is not something that disappeared in the 20th century. 
we still see uh, that older and less affluent and less educated people are still less likely to use the internet. Most recent um, data from the Pew uh, demonstrates that the over 65s, that's the lowest line there, uh, only about three quarters of people over 65 are using the internet in any form, whether it's by phone, by smartphone or, uh, uh, or computer. Um, we see the lowest income brackets are less likely to use uh, uh, the internet, and we also see people with high school educations and less also, again, um, only about three quarters of them are on the internet in any form. And this is the broadest question. This is, this is incorporating um, smartphone as well as uh, computer access. Now, um, as Dr. Bennett did point out, we do see a very interesting swap in smartphone-only internet access. We see entire generations of Americans who've skipped over computers direct and gone directly to smartphones. And so this is um, a very interesting um, population. We can actually reach people with lower education levels who do have smartphone-only access. But it matters which population you're looking at. It's still, that does not, for example, help us necessarily reach the over 65s who, are, uh, who remain less likely to be, for example, smartphone-only internet users. Uh, so these, these uh, patterns have affected adoption of electronic patient portals. This is a, um, we've heard over the course of the last two days, um, some, a lot of optimism about electronic medical records and particularly uh, electronic patient portals. Um, how many people in this room have a patient portal account where you can log on and see your medical record? Most, most people, yes. Um, so this is a technology that allows you to see your lab test results. It allows you to um, uh, build your relationship with your healthcare provider by messaging. And uh, collecting patient reported outcomes is another opportunity here. I think we are particularly excited about the opportunity for uh, uh, reminding or inviting patients to engage in clinical preventive services because we can send reminders. You haven't had a mammogram in, in two years, you, uh, or you're, it's time for your annual, annual flu shot. Uh, electronic patient portals, however, have demonstrated the same slower adoption rate among uh, more disadvantaged populations that um, uh, we've seen, uh, particularly it's been a bit of a barrier with the lower income uh, uh, patient populations. So this is why in informatics we're a little bit worried about this. We know that low resources is associated with wor worse health. We also know that people with lower resources are less likely to be reached by these information technology interventions. So we are concerned that we could be creating a new set of interventions that disproportionately reaches people who are already in better health. And then we have a situation in which we already have a divide between haves and haves nots, and perhaps the information technology actually exacerbates that divide. Uh, what do we do here? And I think there are a lot of opportunities, and we've seen um, a lot of really in interesting um, uh, innovation in this area as well. So let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, I can't say I've got the, the, the solution here, but I think we've got some directions. Um, as I mentioned, I do a lot of my work with the Institute for Family Health. They're a New York City-based uh, FQHC. Um, they have about 24 sites in and around New York City, ranging from school health clinics to uh, mental health to uh, uh, community centers. And uh, they're about 25% um, uh, to 30% uninsured population and about 25% Medicaid. Um, they were, despite the safety net population, they were an earlier adopter of information technology. They rolled out an electronic patient portal in 2008. And in 2011, we did the first um, retrospective analysis of users, and we found that, not surprisingly, the poorest and the minority patients were less likely to, to jump on board with the portal. Um, however, we didn't stop there. We started saying, okay, why? And somewhat unexpectedly, when we traced how those patient portal accounts were created, we discovered that, in fact, it was the physicians <laughs> who were disproportionately offering the portal to the white patients, and they were disproportionately offering the portal to the insured patients. Now, I don't know if this is an issue of implicit bias. I don't know if this is an issue of uh, those of the patients who are most likely to ask about it. Um, I don't know if the clinicians were exercising clinical judgment, saying this is who we think will use it, but the effect was very clear, that different populations were more, less likely to get access to this in the first place. Um, to their credit, Institute for Family Health immediately 
uh, decided to take action on this. And in 2011, as soon as we published this uh, finding, they changed their policy. They took that responsibility essentially out of the hands of the physicians, and they put it in the front desk. So they reorganized workflow. They re reorganized the, um, the, the check-in process. So as soon as you walked in for your appointment, you'd be checked uh, to see if you had a patient portal account. And if not, the account was generated right there. Your password was given to you with a flyer about how to use it. And then when you went into your doctor's office, you could actually now ask, you know, what is this new thing that I have? So not surprisingly, the race disparity in offers uh, almost immediately disappeared. Um, but what was more exciting was that over the subsequent years, the race disparity in usage also disappeared. So the black-white differences entirely disappeared over four years, and the Latino-non-Latino -Latino differences also disappeared. The one difference that did not fully disappear was uh, Medicaid versus privately insured. Uh, so there, are, there remain financial barriers outside of our control that probably were uh, creating um, a, a, an additional hurdle to portal use. Uh, but I think that that's um, you know, one example of how the, in fact, it's the organization of the clinical setting that was creating the disparity in the first place. Uh, and removing that barrier took us a long way toward where we wanted to be. <clears throat> Another innovation that Institute for Family Health uh, worked on was uh, this, this problem of, by definition, electronic patient portal is full of medical jargon. You log on and you see these incomprehensible terms. You see a lot of numbers with no context. And uh, in order for uh, any patient to benefit from this, but particularly perhaps a patient with low literacy or low health literacy, um, there needs to be some help uh, to interpret this. Institute for Family Health partnered with the National Library of Medicine and as well as Epic uh, Software to develop a, um, a hyperlink system so that any term that appeared in the, in the electronic medical record that was visible to the patient was automatically hyperlinked to a medical encyclopedia that was written at about the eighth grade reading level. So uh, pretty, pretty good there. And this is a free resource. I highly recommend it from the National Library of Medicine. Uh, so this is sort of how it looks if you're a patient. Um, in the EHR, the physician's uh, uh, facing side of things, you would see the ICD, this is the ICD-9 code, 34.0 for streptococcal sore throat. From the patient side, that's automatically translated to strep throat, so a more familiar term. It's, a, it's got an underline, demonstrate that it's a hyperlink, and if you click on it, you have an immediate pop-up window with the, the definition, um, the, the treatment, and the, the risk factors. When this was deployed and we started analyzing use, really exciting thing happened. This never happens. This encyclopedia, those hyperlinks, were used more often by black patients than by white patients. They were used more, like, more often by Latino patients than by non-Latinos. And they were used more often by residents of the Bronx, which is our poorest and most diverse borough, than by residents of any other borough. As I said, this never happens that we make an information resource available, and it's used most often by the disparity populations that we want it to be used by. So I think that this is another example of uh, adapting the technology to the needs of the patients. We recently um, completed a, a smaller systematic review of, of patient portal research, and we found more than 100 studies documenting disparities in adoption of patient portals. Um, so you can stop now. We don't need any more studies showing that. Um, we did find a small number of studies trying to do something to address those disparities, and I think that that's what is, is more interesting. Um, a number of these provided some sort of training for patients, training them in how to uh, use either technology or the portal in particular. Uh, some of them provided technical help or patient navigators. Um, we've heard about that earlier today, uh, sitting down with the patient, helping them set, it, set up the, um, uh, the account or navigate through it. Um, alerts or reminders, encouragements essentially from the doctor or from the healthcare system to log in, um, and, and, and perhaps a reminder that there's new information there that you might want to find, you might, might want to read. Um, providing patients with either devices such as uh, tablets or phones uh, or broadband access. Um, as I mentioned, redesigning workflow to make sure that patients all have access to this. Um, a, a, a clear um, uh, win is to provide mobile access to that website to redesign this technology for improved usability. 
relatively minor usability barriers that probably everyone in this room would find trivial that we would uh, overcome with a, a little bit of trial and error can be a major deterrent to someone who is not familiar with computers, someone who's using computers rarely or for the first time. So usability is, can be a serious barrier. Um, and then a number of efforts to provide better content and features that uh, patients actually think that they would benefit from and that therefore are, it's a draw that they would, they would come to the portal. So for example, um, definitions, patient education resources, um, and uh, uh, disease-specific content that they might want. So um, in summary, this particular systematic review does suggest that training patients is effective. It is a little bit hard to scale. It's labor-intensive. You need to um, uh, assign a, an expert to sit down with a patient. It, uh, it's pretty costly. So uh, I, I think I also have a little bit of a concern that it has a, simple, a central assumption, which is that the patient is not well adapted to the healthcare system, and we need to change the patient. So uh, I'm more excited about opportunities to redesign the system for the patient rather than the patient for the system. Uh, that's harder to do. <laughs> uh, so when we look at all of these different interventions that have been tested, um, there, the ones sort of highlighted in gray here are ones that have more to do with redesigning either the technology system or the healthcare system for the benefit of the patient rather than, than the patient for the system. Uh, so my recommendations um, on the basis of, of this is that um, we still see a, a tremendous opportunity for portals to, to um, uh, promote the adoption of preventive services, um, to engage patients with the healthcare system. But we have to recognize that the earliest adopters of any new technology are likely to be the most affluent and the most educated. Um, this is not going to go away just because adoption of patient portals is now at 30 to 40 percent across uh, across the nation. Um, when we move from 4G to 5G, we're going to see a similar um, disparity arise where the more affluent and more educated people are going to be the, the quickest to switch. So every time we change technologies, this, this should be a concern of how do we adapt these technologies to the people who actually need them the most. Uh, we do see that training patients to use information technology uh, is, is probably necessary. We have evidence that it is effective. Uh, but we know it is challenging to deliver to everybody who needs it. And so uh, we, this is an opportunity for us to take a look at the systemic barriers that are uh, creating barriers to technology use. Um, ensure that all patients actually are offered access. Um, it seems trivial, but that means, for example, the flyers in the waiting room have to be in the patient's language. They can't only be in English. Um, the offers have to be made to every single patient. I'll just quickly say that national data currently, in national surveys, only 50% of patients say they have been offered access to their medical records. Uh, it probably actually is higher than that, but only 50% of patients either remember or recognize that that's what they were offered. Um, providing Some of these are very unsexy and, and on-the-ground type of interventions. Provide tech assistants and navigators. Dr. Bennett had a great example of how you need a ton of tech support, particularly for new computer users or new phone users. Uh, improving usability, improving using plain language, interpreting medical language, um, uh, adapting to patients' health literacy, adapting to where, what patients bring to us. Providing contents and features that patients want and need definitely have to offer everything on mobile and make sure it is at least as good as the website. We still see a lot of disparities where the website has more content than the mobile device version. Um, definitely offer in Spanish or the language of your patient population. And, and we unfortunately see that a lot of stuff is translated into Spanish and it, the translation's not that great. Or um, something that we've started noticing is that the front page is translated nicely and then the deeper you go, the shoddier the translation gets. <laughs> so it looks good on the surface. Um, provide free access. If you really want uh, low-income patients uh, to use these technologies, again, Dr. Bennett had some great examples of actually providing these wearables to the patients. Do not assume that they will bring their own devices at all times. Um, and finally, as I mentioned, um, I don't think we actually need more studies demonstrating that the disparity exists. We would really like more studies of um, innovative ways to overcome these disparities and uh, ways to track whether these actually influence 
adoption of patient portals, which could, in fact, be a great tool for preventive services. So thanks very much. Um, <laughs> I'll just uh, quickly note that uh, we had sort of two potential di directions for these talks, and um, both Tiffany Van Oten and I decided to go with the patient perspective. But during the discussion, if there's further, I'm also you know, embedded in the informatics group in my medical center and would be happy to uh, have a larger discussion about the use of electronic medical records and uh, databases for, uh, for disparities research as well. So thank you very much. Hello, everybody. My name is Tiffany Vino, and I'm from the University of Michigan School of Information and School of Public Health, and I also direct our Masters of Health Informatics program. And I'm here to speak to you today about integrating and disseminating diabetes prevention information into the primary care setting. So I have no information to disclose. My agenda is to begin by situating this particular problem of disparities in diabetes prevention in broader health disparities, uh, building on some of the comments of others in this session. Then I will talk about some health information technology intervention approaches, and I'd like to emphasize here technologies and how they're purported to work. So I'm going to talk about universal versus targeted types of interventions, as well as potential mechanisms for interventions in the healthcare setting. I will also then conclude with recommendations. And my emphasis here was on reviewing some of the existing research as well as talking about some of my own. I am talking about examples that are drawn from outside of diabetes prevention strictly because there's very little work in that particular area as we've been hearing about from the systematic reviews. So I'm also going to be talking about things like secondary prevention in diabetes care. I'll be talking about examples outside of um, the area, of things like blood pressure control. So looking at sort of the, the promise of these intervention strategies for different types of clinical outcomes. So I begin by sharing a model of an extension of the World Health Organization model of health disparities. And this model is one that can be read typically from right to left with the dark blue box on the right indicating impacts on disparities in health and well-being. And the sort of key points to take away from this particular diagram is that we have micro-level factors, which are individual level, that influence health disparities. Those include things like psychosocial factors and behavioral and biological factors. And those are where the majority of our technology and other, folk, other types of interventions have focused. And then we have more upstream opportunities like living and working conditions, social and community networks, and the health system, which influence disparities. Then moving further to the left, we look at macro level factors that drive disparities. And in particular, each of the blue boxes on this model recommend or suggest places where we could try to intervene. So we could be intervening on things like trying to reduce social hierarchies. We could be intervening on trying to reduce harmful exposures or decreasing vulnerability or then we could also be looking at differential consequences with regards to health. Now, what I'm going to talk about is really focused on the health system, but really the key point I'm trying to make here is that there are obviously a num number of other factors at play, so we are looking at one slice of this particular area. I'm also now sharing the model from Gomez and McGuire uh, that looks at the sources of disparities in healthcare quality. And this is a model that was created for minorities and non-minority populations, but I think that there is a value beyond that particular setting. And what this really presents in the red box is a kind of typology of the factors that go into driving disparities in healthcare quality as it's provided. So we see here there are discrimination, biases, stereotyping, and clinical uncertainty. Those are more at a provider level. Then we see issues related to how the operation of the healthcare system works to uh, differentially affect quality of care. And then we see differences that are patient-related, related to clinical appropriateness, needs, and preferences. 
So I'm going to be talking about each of these particular mechanisms by which disparities are produced in healthcare in the context of intervention strategies. So this is a typology that I've created that outlines certain strategies that map onto these mechanisms that drive healthcare disparities. So on the left-hand side, we see the distinction of universal or targeted approaches. So universal approaches would be those that are intended to be for everybody who is a patient in a particular health system. The targeted approaches would be more for specific populations. And we've heard some about targeted interventions, but a bit less, I would say, about universal interventions. So I'm going to talk a little about those as well. So the next column from the left are the various mechanisms that I showed in that Gomez uh, model. And then if we look at intervention strategies, I'm going to talk about those a little bit. So one of the main intervention strategies that we see in technology-based interventions today is the idea of standardization and trying to achieve guideline concordant care through some form of standardization. I'd say there are three classes of ways that happens mainly in technology. One is prompting, which we heard a bit about uh, yesterday, which involves things like clinical reminders and alerts. So that's trying to get a clinician to do something at a particular time by reminding them that they should do it. Then we have the idea of default care processes, and those are really about trying to reduce decision-making burden by having standard actions that are guideline concordant. So here we see things like order sets, care pathways, clinical algorithms, etc. Then we have interventions that are more targeted towards healthcare providers' self-regulation. So you give them feedback, and you are trying to have a healthcare provider take that in and try to adjust their performance in order to improve. And those main mechanisms are things like audit and feedback. Then we have interventions that might be more complexity reduction focused. So those are things that try to address barriers in the healthcare system. Here we might see things like simplification of processes and tools. One of the main uh, approaches that I think is really exciting in this area is the idea of one-click actions. So those are things that are simplified by making it so that there's less complexity for a patient or a provider, and instead transferring that complexity onto a technology that kind of bears that burden on behalf of individuals. We also can be looking at things like universal literacy precautions within organizations. I'm not going to really talk about that, but that's another kind of standard approach. And then we could be looking at targeted interventions that address those differences in clinical and social needs amongst patients. And here we typically see interventions that try to identify needs and then target resources towards addressing them. And the main approach I would say that uses technology that we see is population management. Typically, that involves some form of risk screening or extraction, some form of risk algorithm or an approach to identifying who's at risk, and then some kind of matching to supplemental services. And so I'm going to talk about each of these interventions, and in particular, drawing from some of what Jessica Ankers just spoke about. I'm going to be talking about some of the issues related to potential differential effects um, or heterogeneity of treatment effects related to interventions. So I'm starting by talking about discrimination, and in particular, those prompting actions, default care processes, and provider self-regulation. And one of the key points in this particular area is that few studies have ever examined the equity effects of universal strategies related to technologies, and there are fewer studies as well that look at outcomes of targeted interventions for disparity groups, but there is a bit more there. So this is a meta-analysis from 2012 that looked at standardization or various forms of interventions in diabetes care and looked at their net treatment effect. And as you can see here, the idea of clinician reminders is something that is shown to have a net benefit with regards to reduction in HbA1c in diabetes care. So if we look at that particular idea, so that's the average effect, but then if we look at studies that have actually examined any kind of heterogeneity of treatment effect, we see that in three studies that looked at prompting screening actions of various types, so smoking, diabetes, or cancer, uh, one study showed that it might favor disparity groups. That was a study that looked at smoking-related screening involving nurse practitioners. And then there there were two studies that showed no effect. 
In studies that looked at trying to prompt treatment actions of two studies that I was able to locate, um, they had neutral or mixed effects with regards to equity and process outcomes and no impact on intermediate health outcomes at all. So the, the evidence is quite mixed with regards to that aspect of standardization. With regards to default care processes, there are two studies that have very recently been published uh, that look at immigrant populations and trying to standardize responses to common health conditions in these groups. So there was one study that looked at order sets and culturally tailored actions around South Asian immigrants in, um, in basically community-based practices. And they found that there was an improvement in blood pressure control. This was a stepped wedge quasi-experiment. And then another study found with Cambodian immigrants um, that a mental health screening and care pathway uh, was effective with regards to increasing depression and uh, symptoms and uh, diagnosis. So then if we look at the idea of audit and feedback, that idea of trying to prompt uh, provider self-regulation, we see that, again, patient registries are very commonly a part of these interventions, and we typically have audit and feedback. And there is, on average, a net benefit with regards to trying to improve HbA1c and diabetes care. But then if we look at studies that have looked at heterogeneity of treatment effect, uh, I was only able to locate one. And this was a descriptive study, longitudinal, that looked at 198 primary care practices. And this study actually found that it favored advantaged groups. So it favored whites, it favored white, um, non-Hispanics, and it favored people with higher SES with regards to blood pressure control. So here we see not necessarily a benefit and possibly something making things worse. So now I'm going to move to operation of healthcare systems and the legal and regulatory climate. So here, the idea of process simplification and complexity reduction through one-click actions is uh, focus. And here I was able to locate two studies that focused on uh, trying to change care processes within healthcare. And these were really about trying to make sure that needs were met that patients had. One was a case study that looked at a medical legal partnership in which automated shutoff prevention letters that were integrated into the EHR were used. And they actually increased the number of letters that were able to be produced and reduced the amount of time very significantly from 30 minutes to 30 seconds to produce these letters. Another study looked at trying to refer, um, trying to engage, get, have clinicians engage interpreters for, pe for patients with little, limited English proficiency in an urgent care cancer center center setting, and this found that it increased clinician calls to uh, frequency, the frequency of clinician calls to interpreter services. So these were two that showed improvements in healthcare processes with regards to meeting patient needs. Then we have the idea of population management. And as I mentioned, there are three parts to this, these typical interventions, and they really are about trying to address differences in clinical and social needs amongst diverse patients. So it's this part of the model. And so here we're starting to see more types of interventions that are trying to have this healthcare system act in some way on these other determinants of health. We see efforts to try to address things like psychosocial factors that are facing patients, like uh, their financial state. We also see things like living and working conditions, addressing things like homelessness, uh, trying to increase or adapt people's social support, et cetera. So here we've seen quite a lot of effort that's been uh, allocated towards population management, especially related to social risk or what's often called social determinants of health related screening or data extraction. And so there's a lot of data that has historically been collected that's of this nature, that's been mostly verbal or recorded in some form of clinical notes. But what we've seen is a massive shift towards more structured data collection um, and the implementation of various kinds of structured tools and electronic health records. And we've also seen efforts to try to use natural language processing to, attract, to extract some of these details from notes and more attention to commercially available data sets. 
Um, with regards to risk algorithms, so there is some work trying to use the social determinants of health data to try to improve performance. And most of that work to date has really looked at hospital-related readmissions. But uh, some studies have shown improvements in the performance of predictive algorithms when trying to use these kinds of data. Uh, some have not, necessarily. And if we look at this phenomenon of matching people to supplemental services, so um, this is, a, I'm showing here some studies then with regards to their intervention effects. And we see that two of them that I'm talking about here had positive effects. One was a targeted intervention for low SES populations, and then another favored disadvantaged, uh, dis disadvantaged groups. And these were, one was a chronic care model, a very complex intervention, but it had EHR changes as part of it. And this study had an improvement in the patients of, proportion of patients that had controlled blood pressure. This other study was focused on colorectal cancer screening and it found that it increased the rates of colorectal cancer screening um, with a, an approach that involved identifying people who had overdue uh, colorectal cancer screens and then facilitating contact through a scheduler or, or letters and then some kind of intensive follow-up with a navigator for people who were at high risk. There was also a study here that looked at providing clinicians with feedback and then also matching it with a population health coordinator, neutral effects we saw uh, with regards to equity. And then for another, there was a positive effect. This focused on trying to uh, give community health workers technologies for decision support related to diabetes treatment. And this one did improve some psychosocial measures like satisfaction with medication information and diabetes distress. There's also some emerging work that's in the area of referral-based systems, especially efforts to try to link people to services that are outside of care. Um, and sometimes those outcomes can be beneficial. There was a study that showed that in a cluster randomized control trial. But one of the things that I think is an area of which future work is really needed is the idea of trying to actually use these data to inform clinical decisions or inform care in some way. And this is the result of some, some observational work that I've done with colleagues that looks at how clinicians are using psychosocial information in order to make clinical decisions. And this is in the context of diabetes care, but the main point about this model is really that the information is being used and it's being used to make assessments about the patient and about how um, and about various aspects of treatment like clinical risk and feasibility of options. And it's then in turn influencing treatment decisions. So this is happening, but there's not necessarily technologies to support it. And I'd suggest that this may be an area for particular attention with regards to prevention ser preventive services. So to conclude, my recommendations are that as I've shown, there's, a lot, there's very few studies that actually look at equity effects related to universal interventions related to health information technology. And even more so, there's not a great deal that looks at underlying mechanisms when things do work or when they are, not, when they are or not um, equity positive. I believe there's also promise with regards to HIT-based complexity reduction interventions as a basis for intervention, especially given the complexity of some preventative services. And so I think there's a need for greater uh, investigation in that area. Also, I think that there's a need to support research regarding use of that social risk data that's increasingly being collected in diabetes prevention interventions and decisions. I also would suggest that we really do need to compare the effectiveness of different approaches. So, for example, what, when is universal versus a targeted approach best? Who is it best for? When is it uh, most effective? I think we also need to look at whether certain kinds of approaches are better. So is complexity reduction better than supplemental services? Um, or is it better to have standardization of this type or that type? So I don't think we really know any of those things, and I think we really need to go a long way to open the black boxes of many of our technology-based interventions and really understand how they work and also whom they work for and when they work, why they work. Thank you. I want to thank the speakers. That was uh, exciting and innovative and forward-looking. 
Uh, we're going to start with questions and comments from our panel. Yeah, thanks for some great, great presentations. Uh, Gary, uh, in particular, you talked about some of the cost implications of these technologies, um, which presumably have a fairly high upfront cost and then uh, hopefully some scale-up value. Can you give us some ideas with, about what that looks like and particularly how it compares to some of the other uh, strategies that, I, I don't know if you've been here the last couple of days, uh, but how they compare to some of the other non-HIT-oriented kinds of things? So. Sure. So I can give you a, um, uh, maybe less on the comparative side, but I can give you just a, a, a just all sense of this from, say, the texting space. Uh, so um, the the let's say um, for me to scale an intervention from 100 users to 10,000 users uh, is would roughly be um, once the system is built um, would be maybe. A, a delta of about fifty dollars per month, um, in terms of paying the uh, sort of operating costs of sending that many more text messages. So the incremental cost savings are tiny. Um, where you experience um, the, the most of the cost is in the area of the initial build, uh, and then in the technical support, customer service space. But the actual cost of delivering the, these technologies is very, very tiny. Um, that's for, say, interactive voice response, text messaging. Um, once you walk into the mobile app world, it's a, it's a very different uh, case. There's often more iteration through mobile apps, particularly as you, uh, you, you tend to use iteration, that is, um, programming the app many times over in order to maximize outcomes of interest. So if I want someone to hit that button, then I might change its shape and its color and its size and its nesting and all these things. And so you do that over multiple iterations. Uh, even that kind of cost is dramatically less than what you would pay, say, at FTE if someone to deliver a, a service in a clinic. Comments from other folks? Thank you. Yeah, I think this, I was going to just quickly yeah. say, um, one of the things that you said toward the end of your talk um, was how, why many of these things are outside the medical system. And this gets back, um, yesterday I asked a question about the larger incentives. The, the medical organizations are um, responding to a network of, uh, of federal um, incentives as well as reimbursement strategies. And uh, this initial cost of setting up something new, even if the incremental cost afterwards to scaling it to more patients, may be prohibitive for um, you know, an FQHC or even an academic medical center unless it's you know, grant funded. And then um, that's where we get into what are we paying these medical centers to do? We're not unfortunately paying them to keep people healthy, which would be great. <laughs> I think that's right. And, you know, the way I tend to think of it is, you know, medical centers don't build their own medical devices. They don't make their own medications. Um, they buy those things. They're purchase services, and so is digital health. Thank you. So this conversation, this question and response just got me thinking. Um, so as you, you know, you're thinking about the, the cost of these technologies per, you know, interaction, et cetera, relative to, say, a FTE of a person, et cetera. Now, yesterday, there was a lot of emphasis throughout the day on, on high touch, on relationship building, on having that personal connection with people, and that that is really important for um, addressing this disparity gap and uh, um, improving uh, equity. Now, one could argue both ways, right, that what, you're, what you all are describing increases that, connection now you know we also will often argue at home that everybody's on their iPhones now and they're not actually talking etc so um, can you um, give us some of the pros and cons or discuss that a little bit like how is this actually relate to that high touch discussion of yesterday or does it exacerbate that divide um, could you talk a little bit about that so I can start by referring to the Heisler study, which was one that I talked about, the decision support study that looked at community health workers who had a tablet-based application that they brought to patients' houses. They did a visit with patients for one to two hours and walked them through it. This, one of the things that they got in terms of feedback that people loved the most 
was that visitor. <laughs> and that was really one of, I think it might have been a co-intervention in a sense, because there is the sense that to be effective, they needed this kind of mediation and that contact and relationship. And I think we see that actually over and over again with regards to interventions that, especially with vulnerable populations, that some kind of mixture of human contact, some kind of relationship with people who care about you, um, that that is something that is important to complement some of the things that technology makes easier. I will also highlight, though, that for some populations, technology use is very social. So things like patient communities and for younger populations that might be on social media, um, technology can be very much a part of the sociability that we see every day. And so I would say that depending on the marginalized group that we're talking about, um, on, on, online forms of sociability or interaction or relating may be uh, valuable and sufficient. One um, application of these technologies, I think that is a little tangential, but I think relevant here, is that um, patients in particular appreciate the opportunity to save, uh, to, ma to make their work burden less. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's something where, I mean, you know you have to pay your bill. You know you have to refill your medication. Um, you may already have a relationship with your physician, but does that mean you actually want to go in, take a half day off of work, which may be really challenging, to get your medication renewed? Um, so uh, particularly among populations of people who are accustomed to doing their banking online and taking, easing their burden of their daily life through technology, we see that they also like to use, for example, patient portals and technologies in that way. That doesn't, that sort of transactional event isn't necessarily therapeutic. <laughs> um, so in um, psychiatric interventions, cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, weight loss interventions, you need uh, a therapeutic relationship with a human being. Um, I think you mentioned this as well, that you like the, the the technology to mediate that. But there's also um, this room for sort of making people's lives easier by making the transactions that they've got to do anyway simpler. <laughs> so we do see bill paying and, and medication renewals as very popular uses of the patient portal among those users. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, I, I've been coding my whole life, so I, I come to this, I'm a clinical psychologist, but I, I come to this primarily as a software coder. So when I initially started this work, my, my intention was to get the humans out of the business, right? So it was to try to figure out ways of using digital ret to replicate what happens in a best-of-breed clinical encounter. Um, I have since learned uh, that that's folly, right? That, that, uh, and in fact, the literature suggests that. There's no studies um, in weight loss that suggest that a totally digital treatment can produce clinically meaningful outcomes, full stop. Um, there are no studies in uh, blood pressure control that suggest the same. They all require humans of some sort. Um, in order to maximize treatment outcomes. So I, I guess I, the first response to your question would be that we don't have an evidence-based, I think, at this point that suggests, at least in, the out in those outcomes, as to what you would do to leverage a wholly digital approach in order to maximize clinical outcomes. Um, what I have observed, in our trials anyway, uh, is that you can leverage digital in this as this kind of middleware solution to help to make the humans uh, better at their jobs and to help to make more efficient their care delivery and more informed to their care delivery. And in the sort of complex morass of clinical care delivery with the kinds of patients that I tend to work with, I think our, our physician colleagues need all the help that they can get to help to triage and figure out how, what they're going to handle when. And so these kinds of solutions can, can be very, very helpful in that regard. I think my question may have sort of been answered, um, but uh, this idea uh, that came up about technology to produce engagement, uh, which made a lot of sense in the weight loss where people who were more engaged uh, saw better results. But I'm sort of thinking a lot of our mandate is related to the screening. And so how do you, does technology have a role in producing engagement with the idea of, of screening? Um, I'm sort of struggling to think where the applications might be there and curious. Um, what your perspectives on that would be. There, there have been a couple of studies in a very specific population, and that is employees. Um, so employees of a particular company who are using that 
electronic patient portal, for example, um, and they get the reminder for their annual flu shot. They knew they had to do it anyway. Oh, right, it's flu season. Um, and you will see some uptake because of that. Um, again, it, it, especially if there's some com complexity reduction part of it where not only do you get the reminder, but um, the, uh, you know, the nursing staff are happen to be in your building on Thursday, and you can go down and get your shot. Um, so uh, there, the, the alerts and reminders for other populations, I think the evidence is a little bit more mixed, and I think you actually presented some of this about whether if I get, you know, I log on to my patient portal and it says, you know, I'm due for my mammography, but I actually know I got my mammogram across the street at the other medical center and my primary care doesn't actually, it's not updated anyway, so I know to disregard that. Um, that, that is sort of the, the hope and I'm not sure that we've seen that um, delivered on yet. Sorry, I'll just mention I, that study that I, I identified with regards to colorectal cancer screening, that one where there were reminders sent, but there was also the identification of people who needed more assistance, more, the intensive case management. I think that perhaps some more of a kind of stratified approach might be uh, more effective with regards to those kinds of actions. Can I, can I just argue quickly that this is where our approach to kind of single outcome science really hurts us. Um, so, for example, uh, if, if you were to ask me about our, our work, right, I, I can tell you that the thing that I think we're reasonably good at is long-term engagement to medically vulnerable populations, right? We can get them to use our apps for extended time horizons. Um, are we maximizing weight losses at the level at which I would want? No, by no means. Um, but if I have somebody using my app a year later, the question I think I should be asking is what else can I do with that time, with those eyeballs? I should be prompting flu shots. I should be prompting reminders for colorectal cancer screening. And, but there's no, there's no ability for me to investigate those questions. On this point, the commercial world is way ahead of us, and it gets to this employer piece. I was speaking with an employer who, who happens, a, a vendor who happens to run a physical activity uh, promotion app for employers. And in the conversation, I was interested in it for the physical activity purposes, and in the conversation, he revealed that he wasn't, that actually what he was really interested in was notifying employees about flu shots. But he knew that nobody would sign up for a flu shot reminder service. They would, however, <laughs> sign up for a physical activity promotion event. And, um, and that's, you know, those are the kinds of opportunities I think, think we have. So um, can you, somebody uh, address the issue of provider reimbursement implications of all this? Because it seems to me like this begs for bundled payment of some kind, but um, is anybody addressing that? <laughs> Don't all jump up at once. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, are you gonna vote in November? <laughs> Sorry. Um, uh, I don't know if you remember yesterday I actually asked a question on this very topic. We had been uh, trying to, uh, I'm still hopeful we might get there, but we were hoping to develop a multimodal approach where we de de uh, delivered decision support to the patients via the portal. Um, we updated their smoking status, that would be helpful, and then um, sort of facilitated through the screening process. And it turns out that the incentives are such that radiology wants more people to get screened. They don't care if they meet the USPSTF guidelines or not. They just want more of them, um, which wasn't what I was hoping for and probably not. But, but the medical center is, is incentivized to do more screenings, not necessarily to uh, follow best evidence. I was uh, more interested in like <clears throat> you, you facilitate things like prescribe or um, prescription refills, um, other you know lab orders, th things that used to require a visit in, action on a provider that they could bill for, um, and now you're you're providing this convenience, but hitting the bottom line of the providers, and that's why that's what I'm concerned about is providers are have the same types of incentives. Like this is. There's some incentives for overuse of technology for like radiologists, but there's an incentive for underuse of technology if it cuts into your billing. Um, yes, we are starting to see movement. Um, there are now billable remote visits so that uh, uh, 
physicians can frequently bill for a telephone visit. Mm -hmm. There's starting to be some um, interest in uh, billing for telehealth visits. That's a little bit most, th there's, there's a CPT code now for that, but most insurers are not necessarily covering that. Um, there's a flip side to this, which is that if they're not billing for the visit and yet they have to approve the, the they have to read their email, they have to respond to the secure message, uh, they have to authorize the medication refill anyway, um, we may in fact be creating more non-billable work for the physicians. And my final comment is it seems to me like when you then set up the billing mechanism, you've created an immense potential for fraud. Um, you know, you just, electronics just magnifies the potential for everything, <laughs> everything good and everything bad. Um, and I'm just, uh, so I'm, I, it, to me, there's unintended consequences in all this. And one of them is, oh, we can start billing for electronic visits now. Well, let's start inventing a bunch of electronic visits. I can just envision this is going to be a huge headache for payers. Thank you. Hopefully, quick question, and then we're going to get to the audience. This is clearly an engaged a uh, uh, lot of interest. Um, we didn't hear the words neural network, deep learning um, yet. There's been presentations and a lot of discussion from folks on we can use these very large clinically derived databases to really profile the most important tests for that patient. Um, in reducing disparities, are there advantages to pursuing that and could there be unintended consequences, weapons of math distraction and all that? Absolutely. So I, I think yeah. unintended consequences with, with regards to machine learning based approaches are a very significant concern. So one area that I think drives that is the fact that people who, there are certain people who have differential amounts of data about them and specifically people who are more digitally connected, there's going to be a lot more data about them available for learning and often we'll see bias in training sets that are used in order to develop various forms of algorithms. And I think that we also, I mean, at basically every stage of developing and testing algorithms, there's the possibility for bias. And there's extensive work that shows that there is human bias with regards to the way that many of these, these um, types of uh, algorithms might function. So I think that it's important to be extremely careful and to be evaluating bias as we move forward. I don't think that we can just uh, say, oh, this is wonderful, look how great the performance is. And it's deep learning. Let's start uh, with from a Twitter question. Yes, we have some online questions and a couple, and if, if time allows, I'll ask Speak both. up. Yeah, there, if time allows, I'll ask both. Um, the first question is for Dr. Bennett. It says, um, how, if at all, did your tool that identified activities to achieve a 500 calorie deficit account for changes in behavior that might counteract the prescribed behaviors. For example, I went for a walk, now I earned a piece of cake. Did this come up as a challenge at all? <laughs> Sounds kind of good that. to me. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, no, I, I, uh, we change the goals on a regular basis. So we have, I, I only spoke about our goal prescription algorithm, but we have goal reassignment algorithms that are delivered uh, intermittently over the course of treatment uh, in order to update those goals to reflect changes uh, in behaviors. And so that's how we can accommodate, accommodate some of those things. Next question is, um, can any of the presenters t speak on the concept of trust of IT in non-majority populations? You can start. Um, yes. <laughs> uh, there is, uh, there are, uh, survey data very clearly shows um, differential levels of trust in uh, information te technology broadly, specifically in um, the major tech companies. Um, and also, even more specifically, in the privacy and security of your medical data. So um, we see uh, uh, particularly less educated populations are uh, more skeptical about the security of, um, um, for example, the online portal account. And that will be an, uh, a reason that people give for not actually turning on their account. Um, we do, there, there's a smaller, uh, there's also some people who have more trust in the electronic 
data than they did in the paper medical records. It, it's a smaller group of people. I'm assuming that they're people who maybe got burned back in the paper world, that the, you know, somebody did look at their medical record and they had some uh, adverse <laughs> experience with that one. Um, but yes, that has been uh, one of the cited barriers to certain people using some of these technologies. Um, it tends to also uh, be more frequent among older people. So younger people are more comfortable in the digital world broadly and have broken down all their privacy barriers anyway. <laughs> so we don't see that level of concern as much among younger patients. Thank you. Yes, yeah. this side. Thank you. My name is Lee Yang. Uh, you mentioned a lot, and that's really important, that resources and skill. And I, I think problem is, uh, especially in rural area, it's hard to find a physician or health services. But if they, are, they have no car and they are homeless, whether it's in urban area or in rural area, it's very difficult. I find in the library now, people are more and more getting library services because their computer are stolen and uh, all hacking and uh, all the viruses really unable to do something. So you see library services is now getting more important, but the people, readers are demand more, but library services are limited. Only very few computers are available so I think we got to think about this availability of equipment to them and the services to them so they can be educated. So I just wonder if we can pay attention to this and really available for them for all those services and especially those homelessness, they, they really need some hygiene and uh, go to the library, and a lot of people there is not really desirable, so they are they will be hesitant to go to the library anyway. So I just uh, we got to pay attention to our social problem and reduce the homelessness. And because the homelessness, they are not really their own fault. They are really default, and there will be homelessness. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Um, if you could focus on, I think there is some literature on uh, digital access among homeless populations. And I know there's some expertise here. So I will just agree with you that I do think that public libraries are an incredibly important source of access to technology for populations that don't have it otherwise. So in rural communities, often we see that libraries may be the only non-religious uh, non institutions to which the public has access. So that's a really important thing. Um, we also see that there are important places for homeless people to gain access to technology as well as people who are low income. I know libraries also uh, typically offer, it may be the only source of free internet in a community and they also typically have people available there who can actually provide help to people in using technologies. I actually get a paper that Jessica and I wrote uh, with regards to it, about intervention generating inequality. One of the things we talk about is problems of access to technology and the promise of public libraries as one of the areas or ways to try to close that gap. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, thank you. And I, as someone who works on a personal health record, uh, or, I'm sorry, the uh, patient portal, um, I was relieved to see much more discussion. I w yesterday I was afraid we weren't going to hear patient portals discussed, and this has been a great discussion to hear. Um, and I work on the uh, Department of Veterans Affairs patient portal for uh, veteran patients. Um, rural veterans and veterans with lower income and homeless are a big concern for us, and we've found that um, the smartphone has been a huge, huge boon for people in those populations. Um, getting that kind of access and engagement, a, digital, a form of digital engagement that leads to a more effective use of the face-to-face -face encounter is, has been just a tremendous, tremendous thing. But I wanted to mention about secure messaging. Uh, there were, uh, because I'm not a, what you'd call a healthcare professional myself, I'm not always sure when you talk about billable hours, but with secure messaging, um, 
we introduced this um, and found the early adopters embraced it, and then we kind of hit a wall until uh, they developed, uh, they included the use of secure messaging by providers, clinicians, and others um, to account for their time in what's called the workload credit within the VA. And it took off because uh, uh, physicians, providers knew that their time was going to be accounted for. And um, having that has meant that uh, secure messaging is the most popular feature. And, be, and we've seen a, a, a 10 point increase up to 40 percent. Um, in some weeks, we see close to 50 percent of the usage on the patient portal is uh, the use of smartphones and tablets. Um, and since our average user is 66 years old and our veteran population is at or below uh, the uh, average income level in the United States, uh, we feel like we're, we are making progress in reaching these kinds of populations. But thank you both to doctors Anker and Cantor for bringing PHRs. Um, well, I will say my thank healthy you. vet, which is the VA um, that's, uh, that's the portal, one. has been a, um, a, a, a leader, I mean, is recognized as, um, you know, a real leader in this field. And I think your point um, also gets to the point we've been talking about here about the financial incentives that are external to the technology. And you, uh, obviously, in the VA, you're not billing for your hours the way right. that the rest of us are but, but, comfortable with. But, but you do have some accountability. Providers were concerned yeah. about, I'm already spending too much time on email. Right. You expect me to do this also. And so by mm -hmm. accommodating that, yes. you, you uh, accomplished a change. I don't know if there's anyone here from Kaiser, but uh, another interesting, I'm sure there is somebody. <laughs> um, uh, Another situation where the incentives are different is Kaiser, which is both insurance and healthcare, of course. And so Kaiser made a major push um, maybe five years ago, if you, something like that, to try to um, promote adoption of uh, secure messaging and remote visits mm -hmm. because they are, in fact, internally incentivized to not have the patient come in for low urgency visits because they're going to get paid anyway. They, they have a more of a per capita type of a system. And uh, so they did get relatively high adoption of that. And they published some papers um, trying to see whether that subsequently reduced things like emergency department use. And they found that it, in fact, did not. But um, they probably did a better job of, of uh, providing primary care anyway. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank, thank you again. Yes, hello. Uh, hello, my name is Kevin Gravely, and I've uh, been here for the past couple of days. Uh, and I just want to make a couple comments. Um, and first, I was looking at the mission of NIH, and it says to seek fundamental knowledge about the nature and behavior of living systems and the application of that knowledge to enhance health, lengthen life, and reduce illness and disability. Um, I feel that um, it's interesting that in the United States, as one of the wealthiest countries, we happen to be ranked 26 among OECD countries for our average lifespan, um, which I would want to push back on it just being uh, low income or disparate groups as being a U.S. problem. Um, I feel that um, though cancer has uh, survival rates have doubled in the last 40 years, uh, the lifetime risk has gone from one in three to one in two. Uh, diabetes is up from 0.93% in 1958 to 7.4% in 2015. A lot of this is due to our diet. Um, I am into the food industry, uh, health and nutrition. I'm 40 years old and perfect health. Um, my family has a long history of living. My great grandmother is 99. Uh, her mother lived into her hundred. Uh, over 100, and a lot of issues are uh, the things that we ingest. Aluminum, for example, causes Alzheimer's. Uh, chlorine in our water. Um, I, I know that obesity, a lot of problems with that is because of the hypothalamus being damaged due to MSG, which is in a lot of our food. It's hidden. It's not just Chinese food. It's called natural flavors, soy protein isolate. Uh, there are a lot of issues that we have to deal with as Americans. 
And it kind of is a thorn in my side when I hear that it's these groups. Uh, number one, these groups are not, um, they're targeted. They're addicted to things like sugar, MSG, but it's not just those groups, it's us as Americans. Uh, and there's so much in our diets that cause us to have a shorter lifespan than say Japan who lives to 84. Uh, so we need to look holistically at the issues in this country that are affecting us due to companies like Monsanto, Cargill, Kraft, uh, pharmaceutical industries like Merck, IG Farben and different things that are affecting us all. And Thank I you. think when we try to separate ourselves Minutes. and look at individual small groups, we miss the bigger picture of what's really happening in our country. And to all of us, seven in 10 Americans are on prescription drugs. So it's not really just low income or marginalized people, it's Americans. Thank you. I could ask Dr. Bennett maybe comment a bit on um, use of technology rather than calorie reduction to food type, and is there progress to be made there? Broader agenda. Yeah, I mean, so so um, uh, the work, my my work, my colleague uh, Dory Steinberg uh, at Duke is doing some really excellent work on this right now. Um, is that, you know, one of the one of the most important advances I think in the last. Uh, I don't know, several generations was the DASH diet trials. I mean, right? I mean, simple adoption of a relatively straightforward, easily accessible dietary pattern has the ability to impact blood pressure at the same level as a antihypertensive in a week. I mean, it's a stunning, it's a stunning effect. And, the, and, and if you look at sort of national adherence to the DASH diet, it's less than 1%. Right? With the how are forty some odd million people who were newly diagnosed with hypertension with the change of the blood pressure guidelines and a couple of years ago, uh, you could you could really mitigate that dramatically with widespread with widespread uh, engagement of uh, adherence to the dash light. So what Dory has been doing is focusing on that question, and I'll just say that you know she has a trial right now, essentially repurposing existing commercial mobile apps which have been downloaded almost a billion times by Americans uh, in the last five to seven years. So you have men, and most all of you have one of the commercial apps on your phone right now for diet tracking. I'm a weight loss researcher and I can keep up with it for about two weeks. But nevertheless, many of you are probably better at this. So she's written technology that repurposes those apps to help people to get more adherent to the DASH diet and it works. And the next step is to use the Amazon Alexas that many of you have in your home to help you to do that at the end of the day and we're finding that that works as well. Um, those kinds of strategies will be easily portable to, to populations of all types. Thank you. Comment from the web. Yes. So it's a bit of a two-part question. What explains the differences seen in the use of HIT in regards to different, different diagnoses, particularly as discussed for cancer prevention? Do we understand why it worked for some cancers but not others? And then sort of piggybacking on that, what impact do you see with the use of HIT on mental health? Amy, maybe you could start with some cancers and not others. What, what would explain why IT worked some of the time and not others? Could you gain insights from that literature? I think it's interesting to try to characterize why it worked for a cancer versus another because the seven studies all addressed different populations, different cancers, and it would, I feel like it would be helpful to have more data that would drill down on that. For example, using the same intervention in different populations for different types of screening. I think that would be more informative than the individual studies in different subpopulations of different technology types. So what I'm hearing is a lot of opportunity to explore EHR or explore mobile apps or explore any one of these interventions, but to, to implement them in different populations using the same intervention. And then we really could have comparative information. And without that, it's really hard to draw a clear conclusion just based on one intervention in one subpopulation in a particular location. So I think that it will become more meaningful if we can look at colorectal cancer screening using, you know, X intervention in multiple populations and, you know, sort of speaking to the way we're measuring outcomes. If you're just looking at one outcome or you're looking at one intervention, we have to be able to adapt them appropriately and culturally um, in multiple settings. And then we might be able to gain a little more insight about how effective they actually are. So hopefully that answers the question. 
and mental health issues. Could you repeat part two of the question? Sure. What impact do you see with the use of HIT on mental health? Okay. So I'd say that it's a mixed bag. Um, I do know that there are, uh, so I spoke about one study where it was being, technology was being used to help clinicians diagnose um, PTSD and depression amongst Cambodian immigrants. And it led to more guideline concordant care. And there was a, a very strong kind of cultural competence component to that intervention as well. And that was one that helped people get better care. Um, but I think that there's, with regards to other kinds of interventions, um, there's a lot of work that's looking that's commercial now that's looking at trying to provide people with mental health interventions remotely um, using various kinds of commercial platforms. I'd say that the, there's a lot of questions about that, especially with regards to the regulations surrounding them. Um, and um, so I'd say that working that is a kind of new emerging space where that is fairly unknown. I wonder if my colleagues have other things to add to that. Yeah, I, I concur. I concur completely. I, I think that the the potential is great, right? A simple algorithm that can assess whether where you are and whether you move um, can do sentiment analysis on the text messages that you're sending. Uh, can look at your post, can do postural detection. Could is a pretty good indication of whether or not somebody is in a depressive episode, right? You can imagine all manner of, there's some good data to that effect, and there are all manner of ways in which technologies could be leveraged, particularly from a screening perspective on depression. I get much more concerned on the treatment side because if there's an area where we know that the human connection matters, it's there. Um, and, uh, and noting the regulatory issues, I'll just say that broadly, we saw California just uh, a couple days ago announce that they're going to do a large-scale trial in effect of two commercial uh, mental health treatments in their uh, in their population, of, I, I believe their employed population. Uh, I'm really concerned about that. Uh, we we certain, certainly would not allow uh, any sort of drug treatment. These, I'm sorry, these are these are uh, commercial treatments that have not had efficacy testing done yet, and so the initial testing will be in the wild, for lack of a better way of describing it. Uh, and I'm really concerned that when we have innovations that emerge like this that seem very exciting in the commercial space, um, that we are less likely to uh, move them through the regulatory pathways when we're talking about digital treatments uh, as compared to other types of treatments. I'd like to ask the last two folks to keep their okay. questions or comments brief. Good morning, Pamela Thornton with NIDDK. Thank you for the excellent presentations. I, I wanna just revisit something, I think a topic that came up and it's the interest in the science of, of engagement. And my question is specifically for Dr. Bennett, but others may have feedback. Um, because your study around your findings around sustained engagement were particularly impressive, do you have some tips for um, what you're doing in the hybrid approaches to sustain, initial, initialize, is there an interim stage, and what are you doing in the sustained stage? You know, for example, is, for the touch part, is there a specific characteristic of the staff, you know, or characteristics you're looking at? Any tips you can give us? I fear that's like a soapbox you just gave me, and I'm gonna try really <laughs> hard not to stand on it. Um, let, me, let me just say that, yeah, there's, this is a, the science of engagement is, I think, one of the things that we really need to invest in. Um, just about all that we want to accomplish, at least in patient-facing technologies, is bound up in this. Um, I'll just tell you a couple of things that, that we do. Um, one is that we do a lot of testing. And um, you, in my view, you have to, you don't, uh, Steve Jobs once said, uh, people don't know what they want. And he meant that in a commercial sense, but in a digital, in a digital sense, um, he's, very, he's right about that. Um, kind of qualitative work where you ask patients what they want to see is not as useful, in my, in my view, as iterating through the design of treatments in order to maximize the actual behavior changes that you're trying to create. Um, and so, but a couple of principles that we found is that you never ask a patient for data without providing feedback. That's an absolute, absolute, and there's a lot, we've, we've tested this, others have tested this, so every, we're always providing feedback. Um, we provide feedback that's highly personalized, um, and personalization may take a variety of forms. Um, and then the, the sort of the notion that of accountability, the idea that someone is always looking at my data, um, can be essentially maximized both in the feedback that you're providing, but also in directing those feedback to other care, that feedback to other care providers who are then also reinforcing the accountability in their interactions with providers. Um, I have a lot to say about that, and I'm happy to do that <laughs> offline. I just saw the one minute mark go up. That was mostly for me. We're coming up on break. Last question. Uh, Dr. Anker, uh, several years ago, the prior 
Commissioner of Health in New York, uh, started a r remarkable and revolutionary program where she insisted that everybody in the health department be educated about structural racism and uh, that that be incorporated into their daily work. It was a, a, a revolutionary thing to do. Um, has, that effect, has that affected the use of uh, health in information technology or do you see that the effects of it elsewhere in, in your work? Um, that's a great point. Um, the, the study that I presented from the Federally Qualified Health Center certainly raised the question about whether provider, um, for example, implicit bias uh, was leading to differential use of the health IT among um, patients. Uh, implicit bias obviously is only one of the issues in structural racism that the uh, disadvantaged populations are suffering from a wide variety of other um, societal and, and as well as health system factors here. Um, the Department of Health in New York City obviously is very forward thinking. They're not offering, um, you know, PHRs directly to patients. So uh, they do a lot of, of direct communication to the public. They buy subway ads and tell us not to drink sugary drinks. Um, they have a lot of uh, resources online that patients can, I'm sorry, anybody in the public can use to, to search online. I don't know whether they've got good data about usage of those resources. That would actually be pretty interesting. So I don't, the answer is I don't know. <laughs> I want to thank all our speakers in the panel and I want to thank the audience. Great discussion. 10-minute break. We'll come back and talk about health systems. It's going to be really interesting and busy. Um, see you in 10. Thank you. We're heading into the home stretch. We have a lot to discuss yet, uh, including the review and discussion of health systems interventions. Um, we're going to start with a video vignette from the director of NIDDK, Dr. Griffin Rogers, on the importance of equity in preventive services from their perspective. And if we could hear from Dr. Rogers. Well, at NIDDK, many of the diseases in our research mission exhibit dramatic health disparities. These include obesity, type 2 diabetes, which place individuals at high risk of many other conditions and complications like kidney disease, while increasing risk for premature death and lower quality of life. About a third of U.S. adults have obesity, and rates are significantly higher among Hispanics, African Americans, Native Americans, Pacific Islanders, and many minority groups. About 12% of U.S. adults, or 30 million people, have diabetes. 90 to 95% of these are caused by cases of type 2 diabetes, which again disproportionately affects certain racial, ethnic, and socially disadvantaged groups. Now, Another 84 million U.S. adults, or about one in three adults, have prediabetes. These disparities clearly point to a need to achieve health equity and preventive services. At NIDDK, we address health equity and preventive services by funding research. In our studies, we strive hard to get broad representation of diverse populations, so we're more confident that the research finding and recommendations will hold true for the populations that are most affected. For example, the NIDDK-led Diabetes Prevention Program, or DPP, recruited heavily among African Americans, Hispanics, American Indians, and Asian communities, and showed that structured lifestyle changes designed to promote modest weight loss can delay and potentially prevent the onset of type 2 diabetes in those at high risk and people from those backgrounds. NIDDK supported translational research led to an adaptation of those interventions that formed the basis of the congressionally established National Diabetes Prevention Program, which is being disseminated nationwide by the CDC and CMS. Achieving health equity and preventive services would improve the overall health of social economically disadvantaged communities where rates of obesity and diabetes are highest. Health equity approaches could transform access to evidence-based services, affordable diabetes screening, and 
feasible treatment options that align with people's cultures and values. This requires strong collaboration with communities, healthcare systems, and researchers. Now, from a research perspective, it's imperative that we develop and test new approaches to prevention, especially interventions that could be used in under-resourced communities, including the innovative use of technologies. I believe achieving equity in preventive services will reduce disparities in diabetes and obesity and help prevent their complications. Therefore, improving uptake of evidence-based services in diverse settings will improve many health outcomes so people have a better opportunity to live longer and healthier lives, regardless of income, where they live, or racial and ethnic background. These outcomes are important for our nation and motivate the work that we do in NIDDK. How's the sound? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah? Okay. I'll just wait for the slides. Great. Hi. My name is Heidi Nelson. I'm from the Pacific Northwest Evidence-Based Practice Center at the Oregon Health and Science University. And uh, we're now going to talk about the evidence review for key question five, which is uh, based on health system interventions. I have no disclosures to um, inform you of today, and I also, before we move on, want to acknowledge the contributions of the full team uh, at the Evidence-Based Practice Center listed here. Key question five. We're finally at the last one of, of this um, conference. Uh, key question five focuses on the effectiveness of interventions that healthcare organizations and systems implement to reduce disparities in preventive services use. This key question focuses on um, system, health system interventions, but as we've shown in this diagram a few times already in the conference, we're also including those that uh, are in other settings but are connected to health systems. And since the health system is probably the most uh, expansive uh, part of this review, uh, we also include those that, include, that are also taking place in clinician um, settings and in community settings that have links to the health system. So the good news is, unlike some of the other uh, questions you've seen so far, we have many studies uh, that address this question. 57 studies in 60 publications met in our inclusion criteria, including 46 randomized controlled trials. We also had uh, two non-randomized trials, two prospective cohort studies, and seven before-after studies. Uh, as with the other um, questions in this review, um, most of them focused on cancer screening for colorectal, breast, or cervical cancer. Um, and uh, three involved obesity management and one high blood pressure screening. Uh, populations included low income, rural, underserved, African American, Hispanic, Asian, and Native American populations, or Native Hawaiian populations. Um, the studies generally compared enhanced screening interventions with usual care or alternative methods and measured effectiveness through improved screening rates. Uh, interventions focused on the patient or more, more generally focused on the health system itself, so system changes versus more direct patient changes. Uh, the patient interventions uh, involved navigation, education, telephone calls and prompts, lay health workers and home visits, and these varied widely. I'll describe them a little as we go uh, today. Um, the interventions that focus on health systems involve the screening checklists, provider training, practice changes, and community engagement, um, those types of interventions. Uh, we found that many different types of populations were included in these studies, and for the meta-analyses, the plots, the tables, we, we adopted a, an abbreviation system so that we could drill down and really see which populations were involved. But as you can see, there were many different permutations of the different types of populations, um, and many studies were sort of a one-off involving only 
a couple, one or a couple studies from a population. So it's very difficult to, in the end, put it together for specific groups. But I think it's important to understand uh, who is in the study as we go through them. Just a reminder um, that we uh, use the, these grade uh, levels for uh, evaluating the strength of evidence and applicability. Any uh, when getting a high grade would be very confident that the, that the uh, effect is true. High applicability rating means that the results of studies would apply widely in practice. So as we first um, look at uh, the results for colorectal cancer screening, we found that there were many uh, trials and additional studies uh, looking at patient navigation. Um, navigation uh, is a broad term that uh, meant many different things to different studies. And in the uh, evidence review, we have uh, tables describing more exactly what was involved in navigation for the different studies. Um, but some of the components include decision aids. We talked a bit about decision aids yesterday, but um, some of the uh, navigation interventions include decision aids, um, uh, personalized barrier assessment, so taking a more personalized view of um, identifying what, what prohibits individuals for, for screening, uh, providing kits particularly for colon cancer screening, the um, FOBT kits, mailed materials, personalized messages, assistance, uh, hands-on assistance with prescriptions, appointments, even transportation. Um, prompt sheets for clinicians and uh, clinics and, and for patients um, about different types of screening. So many variations of this uh, were represented by the term screening uh, for using navigation. Um, for the community navigation studies, um, the community was involved in some very interesting and creative ways. Um, recruitment for colon cancer screening, for instance, happened in barbershops for African-American men. Uh, using lay health workers for um, Hawaiian and Vietnamese populations, uh, recruitment through community centers uh, for Hispanic populations in Texas, and through uh, churches for Korean Americans in Los Angeles. So recruitment using those community sources brought them into a health system. So in the table and in the evidence, we, we separate those out because the community resources were, were unique and in addition but you see there's a fairly robust set of studies for each type, and if we combine them together, we'd probably elevate that strength rating to strong, um, or the high, highest rating. Um, but we've, we've split them out just to be more, um, provide you with more information. So for patient navigation in the health system predominantly, we had 12 randomized trials, over 25,000 um, individuals enrolled, three before-after studies. Um, essentially all showed increased screening rates, except one, one trial. Um, patient navigation using those community resources, five trials, um, 2,500 patients, one non-randomized trial. And that also showed increased screening in all studies, except one trial that showed multiple enhanced screening interventions. So all the arms were active enhanced screening, and navigation uh, showed uh, not particularly a benefit in a, above and beyond the others. Um, so we um, took uh, this to the next level and, and did statistical medical analysis where we put all of those uh, navigation studies together, whether they are community or not. Um, and for randomized trials, we combined them um, into a summary, state, uh, summary uh, estimate of uh, 1.67 uh, risk ratio the, uh, to increase uh, screening for colorectal cancer. The uh, observational studies uh, were combined separately and also showed uh, increased screening rates. Um, we looked at the various types of screening tests. Some studies were specifically uh, about FOBT or FIT tests, showed similar, similar risk ratio. Uh, some studies specific to colonoscopy, also an elevated risk ratio. Most studies had any test. Uh, patients had decisions about what they preferred, and so um, that's where most of the um, trials were, and those were all elevated. Uh, the data gets a little thinner in the observational studies when we look at the specific type of tests, um, but I think what's most revealing, we show you one forest plot today, we have many in the review, um, they all are really uh, showing benefits. So um, to orient you to the meta-analysis, and I invite you to look at the draft uh, evidence report, which is posted to really look at the more, more details here because there are a lot of details we can't um, get into in our short time with you. Um, but uh, you see the tables are all set up in a similar way. We have the screening test 
with the reference to the individual study on the, on the far side. The disparity group using our abbreviation code, uh, so you will need to decipher that with our, our little table there. Uh, we also looked at whether the population had screening at adherence at baseline, if they'd been previously um, adherent or non-adherent, and most showed uh, people, uh, enrolled individuals, without prior adherence. We thought we needed to separate that out to see if that would be a difference. Follow-up times varied, but most were a year or less. And the quality ratings uh, we, we put in the table, these are for the individual studies, um, and they range from the lowest ranking of poor to uh, a few uh, good quality studies. Um, unlike a lot of uh, reviews that we do, we included the poor quality studies in these meta-analyses, um, mostly because the quality rating criteria are really geared for um, trials of medications. And some of the aspects of uh, rating quality, such as uh, blinding, don't really fit this type of um, study. So we are a little more generous in having them in the, the overall estimates. We do uh, separate them out later in sensitivity analyses, I'll show you. Over on the other side of the plot, we have a risk ratio for each study, followed by the number of events, meaning screening events, for the treatment and control groups. Um, and so they, they essentially all combine and they, um, they all work. We know a couple studies did not have statistically significant results, uh, and there are reasons for that, but um, this, is, this is kind of the, the lay of the land for um, patient navigation. Our, um, our sub-analyses showed um, we broke them down by screening, um, by follow-up time, by study quality, by screening and adherence at baseline, and uh, in every case, the risk ratios were elevated and um, uh, mostly statistically significant, where they, they fall out, we usually have less studies. Uh, there were other interventions for colorectal cancer screening, including um, telephone calls and prompts, uh, seven RCTs, one non-randomized trial, one before-after study, and they all showed increased effect among the underserved, a moderate level of evidence. Uh, two trials with lay health workers showed increased uh, screening uh, in those populations. They were targeted to specific cultural language groups. Uh, screening checklist trials showed increased in low-income population. Provider training, now getting into those health system interventions, showed increased colonoscopy rates in one study, but not for FOBT. Uh, and then a study of practice changes in community engagement, which is also, um, uh, you'll see when we look at colorectal, and, or we look at breast and cervical cancer screening, showed increased uh, screening among the underserved in that huge population of many um, low-income uh, clinics. Um, what was included in the practice change intervention uh, involved patient and health system changes with a number of, of interventions occurring at the same time. So moving on to breast cancer screening, again, patient navigation showed um, that we uh, increased screening in all studies. Uh, one trial showed increased uh, screening for African American and all the other races in that trial, but not for Hispanics. Um, so we had eight trials, one before after study. Uh, again, the summary estimates show an increased rate across um, all the studies and, and a combined estimate. We did the same sensitivity analyses and again, uh, uh, significant increases across the board. It get a little thin, then um, the confidence interval start to change, but um, essentially similar um, positive results. Um, breast cancer screening, also interventions regarding uh, patient education showed increased um, screening rates, telephone calls and prompts increased in two trials, no increase in others, so a little bit more mixed. Um, when they used telephone calls and prompts, the community resources, again, uh, increased screening for specific groups um, with no increased screening in a, a study with Chinese Americans. Lay health workers effective in breast cancer screening and home visits uh, which we haven't seen in other studies, uh, but was effective in increasing rates in rural African-American women. Um, looking at some of the system changes, screening checklists, and that big study on practice changes in community engagement also increased rates. Cervical cancer screening, um, we had fewer studies of patient navigation, but they essentially showed increased screening. And in the case of cervical cancer, we want uh, individuals with uh, abnormal pap smears to come back for a colposcopy. Uh, some of the studies looked at diagnostic resolution and navigation helped get uh, women back for that second test. Um, one trial showed um, no increase among Hispanics uh, in that particular trial. 
telephone calls and prompts, unlike breast cancer uh, screening, this one showed no differences among three intervention groups in regards to the colposcopy rate, which was the main outcome. Lay health workers um, showed increased, re increased screening for Hispanics in one trial, but not another. Uh, screening checklist in this case showed no increased screening in low-income women. It was effective for breast cancer screening. And then again, the practice changes in community engagement studies showed increased rates. We had two, um, th three studies, three small trials of obesity management, which um, involved patient education in one trial, um, showed lower BMI, healthier diet, and more exercise among Latino low-income individuals. However, this trial um, did not control well for baseline BMI, so we uh, gave it a, a low rating. Um, a study of lay health worker case management showed no differences in BMI among two intervention groups of uh, Latino individuals. Another one of lay health worker with education sessions counseling, behavior change prescription had no difference either. So um, a, a small set of studies, but maybe a starting point for planning other studies. Um, one study of high blood pressure screening is identification of uh, women with high blood pressure and then um, acting on that um, showed no differences in high blood pressure uh, despite patient education counseling and group activities. So to make uh, a summary uh, of, of these studies, um, 57 studies, um, patient navigation clearly was effective in all three types of cancer screening, and no matter how we sliced and diced the meta-analysis, we found a persistent effect. Um, I would uh, suggest drilling down into the details of what those navigation uh, interventions look like when you have a chance to look at our review. Patient education, also helpful for breast cancer screening and obesity management, but didn't have an effect, and that's one study on high blood pressure screening. Telephone calls and prompts um, were helpful for increasing colorectal and breast cancer screening rates, but not cervical cancer screening. Lay health workers targeted to some very specific groups was very effective in increasing cancer screening. Um, didn't help for the one trial on obesity management. Home visits was effective in the African-American women uh, in rural settings. Uh, screening checklists, some of the um, system changes um, were helpful in some of the cancer screenings, but not for cervical cancer. Uh, provider training, increased rates of colonoscopy in one, one study. And then the um, multiple uh, efforts set um, intervening in uh, practice changes and, and engaging with community on patient and health system um, levels, uh, increased uh, screening for colorectal breast and cervical cancer. So there were, of course, there's always limitations, even though we had a lot of studies this time, um, but there were, um, there, there were a few studies of interventions besides cancer screening, and the ones we had really didn't lead us to, to conclusions. Um, they were small and didn't um, control for important things. So um, uh, that's the limitations of what we can tell you today. We have a lot on cancer screening, but, but little on others. Uh, the types of interventions really varied widely. Um, patient navigation included many components, and it was hard to tease out if one type of approach would be better than another. Um, definitions of the populations were off, also unclear. Um, sort of the biggest category of patients were underserved or low income, which is a, an important but, but very widely uh, varying population in itself. Um, we have lots of suggestions for future research um, to identify those optimal methods to implement patient navigation reminders and the other effective interventions into healthcare settings and populations. It seems when the health system is involved, it, it, it maybe has a more effective reach than um, those in clinic environments that are more are based on a, a smaller set of resources. Uh, identifying the most effective components would be helpful. Defining the services, measures, and outcomes so they can be applied to other health systems would be useful instead of just having it be unique to one system. Um, evaluating bundling of preventive services. The um, few studies that did more than one type of cancer screening, for instance, found that it was effective for, for a number of things. Maybe doing that with some of the other preventive services would create a more efficient model. Uh, measure additional benefits um, that may be peripheral to uh, the, the engagement, uh, such as patient adherence for other uh, types of health care, improved access, health literacy, a number of other things. Um, studies of interventions that focus on um, unstudied populations are still needed. 
Um, and we thought it would be very useful to recruit general populations, which some of the large studies did, but it include and report outcomes based on the disadvantaged groups. We rarely saw uh, data specific to those groups in the results sections. Um, so that would be very helpful. So our key messages um, are that we saw increased rates of preventive services with patient navigation, telephone calls and prompts, and lay health workers that were targeted to specific groups. Um, this may reflect the human touch we were talking about a little bit yesterday as well as today. Um, evidence is strongest for the patient navigation to increase uh, colorectal, breast, and cervical cancer screening. Less effective are the system and practice changes that did not directly involve patients, but it seemed to be a complementary or, or a collaborative approach that, that in, in, together can be more effective. Um, the studies varied. Interventions included multiple components. So I'm not sure what was magic, the magic part of that, but that um, they, they were kind of a, a collection of things that happened. To, um, so please look at our full evidence report. This is my last chance to give a pitch for uh, providing comments. It's available for public comment over the next four weeks. The final version will be available sometime after that, uh, and it'll include new, new studies. Maybe we'll have to tweak our meta-analysis. We'll see some uh, additional material. Thank you. Um, we're here to talk about South Central Foundation, which is a tribally owned and operated healthcare system. My name is Donna Galbraith. I'm the Senior Medical Director of Quality Assurance. I'm a family practice provider. I've worked at South Central Foundation for about 13 and a half years. I'm from Alaska. I'm Atna Athabaskan. And good, good morning. Um, my name is Denise Dillard. Um, I work for South Central Foundation. I've been there since 2001. Um, I am a Nupiak Eskimo. My mother is from a small island off the uh, coast of Nome, and I am the Director of Research for South Central Foundation. So you'll notice we'll be, Donna and I will be um, kind of alternating here, given our different roles um, within the organization. Um, both of us have um, no uh, conflicts of interest to disclose. Uh, these are the objectives of our presentation, and so we're going to be describing a um, complete redesign of the healthcare system that um, was implemented in Alaska, um, as well as associated research findings, and then also um, talk more broadly about considerations for conducting research and healthcare um, uh, implications in tribal communities. I uh, wanted to start off with just some basic background information. Um, you'll notice um, that I've provided citations for most of the information that I'm uh, presenting. You'll see that um, in many of these publications, there isn't really current data, and that really reflects kind of the paucity of, of published literature um, in the area of American Indian and Alaska Native health. Um, on the left side, we see the leading causes of mortality between 1999 and 2009. And as you can see, um, currently, they are the um, chronic conditions that are the focus of this um, uh, of this workshop, which include heart disease um, and cancer, and then uh, diabetes. Um, this is a significant change um, from earlier in history, where really the population was very much effect, um, impacted by infectious diseases, as well as high rates of infant mortality. But you see the shift as people um, are um, given public health measures, but also kind of the changing um, demography of the population, and as people move more into urban um, environments and also changes in the diet. Um, Despite the success of many of the public health interventions, if you look at the average life expectancy, um, there is still a shortened life expectancy for American Indian and Alaska Native people in general um, compared to um, both non-Hispanic black and non-Hispanic uh, white. Um, a really important thing to add into uh, this discussion today is um, discussion about the chronic underfunding um, of the um, healthcare system, which um, uh, provides services to American Indian and Alaska Native um, communities, and I'll talk about why in just a second. Um, 
But um, this is the slide which shows um, expenditures per capita. The Indian Health Service is the federal entity which is obligated by different treaties and other, um, other agreements to provide services to American Indian and Alaska Native people in exchange for land and other resources. Um, but you can see, and this hasn't really changed a whole lot, so um, there's less expended per capita for the average American Indian and Alaska Native person than for a person who is in a, a federal prison. And, and this continues to be the case. Um, the reason this is important when it comes to preventive services is the implication is, is in that many um, Indian Health Service facilities or other tribal facilities, the majority of care is really provided in emergency rooms, and so it's really addressed at um, kind of immediate crises um, and not as much time um, d dedicated to preventive services. So there were lots of treaties in Alaska, uh, but the change actually occurred uh, with the Alaska Native Settlement Act, Native Claims Settlement Act, sorry. Um, and that's where the federal government uh, recognized Alaska Native people and um, settled claims around land. So each area was given um, land and money, and as a result of that, corporations were formed, and each of these corporations serves the health care needs of the Alaska Native people in that area. So we're South Central Foundation, and we're down at the bottom of the slide, the dark-colored area, uh, and that's where we provide pr primary care. Um, even though it's not the majority of the state, it, if you take Alaska, Alaska's huge, and if you were to put it on top of the U.S., it would go coast to coast. And so the area that we serve is basically would be, if you go out to the tip, the Aleutians, it would be, if you put it on top of the map, it would be from California. So people in California would be going to Missouri to get their health care. So that's the span of area um, that we're involved with. Um, the Indian Self-Determination Act and the Indian Health Care Improvement Act in the 70s said that health care would be improved if the people who were being served were actually involved in their own health care, um, and better yet, if they owned it. So South Central Foundation was incorporated in 1982, and it primarily dealt with dental and optometry services. But in 1998, South Central Foundation took over their own health care system and have um, been doing that ever since. Uh, one other thing I wanted to point, about, point out about the state of Alaska is, in addition to being big, there's a lot of tribes here. There are 229 federally recognized tribes with lots of different cultures. Those are the people that we serve. So um, when we took over healthcare, there were um, a lot of focus groups where we talked with Customer owners, uh, those are the people we serve. You, um, most people refer to them as patients, but we don't. Um, and we asked them what it was that they wanted. At the time, health care uh, being run by Indian Health Service uh, had a lot of room for improvement. So the wait lines were incredibly long. Only about 32 people, or 32% of the population, um, were impaneled to a provider or had their own provider is what I should say. And um, the waits to be seen were at least 30 days long, so a month wait. So most care was done in the emergency room, um, and you can hear stories from people who lived through that era who actually would describe the whole family getting together, the, um, they'd pack lunches, and they'd go sit in the emergency room until they could be seen. So um, when we took over care, we asked customer owners what it is that they wanted. Of course, they wanted relationship. They wanted their provider to know them. They wanted to know their provider. They didn't want to tell their story over and over again. They wanted to be seen when they wanted to be seen. They wanted access. Um, they wanted a system that was sustainable, that um, was financially stable, uh, sustainable, and also a system that took not care of not only them as an individual, but their family, the community, and the population. So that's what we based our entire model on, which is very interesting. It's a lot of the things that were, have been discussed in the, um, yesterday and even some today about what needs to be done in terms of health care. So we created a system of care where uh, we have impanelment. So our customer owners impanel to a team, which consists of the primary care provider, 
um, the RN case manager, case manager support, and certified medical assistant. And um, there are about 1,100 customer owners who are impaneled per team so that through time, the team gets to know that customer owner and the customer owner gets to know team. So we really leverage the relationship piece um, for that care. So what we saw when we implemented this is that we had a, actually a decrease in emergency room use and a decrease in um, hospitalization and inpatient stays. So overall improved health care. Uh, we also targeted certain um, health care issues when we took over health care, such as diabetes, um, and we, which led to increased screening and also increased um, uh, overall care of diabetes. So this is some of the, the data that we have here on preventative services on outcomes. Um, and it's a we benchmark against HEDIS. And so we want to know how we're doing. We benchmark usually pretty high. Um, these are all in the, well, there's one in the 10th percentile, but most of these are in the 75th. To, well, actually, the, the 10th percentile is a good one uh, because that one is actually for poor control. We want to be as low as possible for that one, so we're less than 10%. And so for the other screenings, such as breast, cervical, colorectal, and cardiovascular, uh, we score um, very high compared to HEDIS. Data was really important. When we took over healthcare, we realized that in order to understand what we were doing and whether it was making a difference or not, we needed data. Um, and we've heard that. We've heard that from a lot of different people um, yesterday. So what we did is we created our own data system. We actually have real-time data. So once it's in the system, it go and feeds into our data. Um, and then people can use that to see whether what they're doing makes a difference. But also, just as importantly, is that our teams use that data. So as a provider, you can go in and you can look at everybody who's in panel to you and you can see who is, who is due for what. We have action lists so you can immediately know what somebody is due for um, and act on that when they come in. So you're, you're not having to go through the, the medical record or anything. Um, you can actually um, get to those things. Uh, the other part of that data system is that it's unblinded. So I can look at every provider in our system, uh, actually any of our providers can, and they can see how they're doing, and they can see um, who uh, has best practice, and you can, might be able to go to that person and say, you know, what are you doing that's different than me? I want my numbers higher, and actually um, take those best practices. So this is a little bit more of our team. We, since we want the relationship based, we want our customer owners to stay with our team. We actually ha um, have an improved um, support around our team. So part of our team is an integrated approach. We have behavioral health consultants, certified um, nurse midwives, registered dietitians, and pharmacists right there sitting with the team. We also have um, co-located providers to help support the team so that the care can continue to be done within the team. So we have a pain physician, we have an HIV consultant, we have um, a psychiatrist, home health, lactation consultant, uh, pediatrician, an EHR um, coach, colorectal cancer screening that support the teams. And beyond that is um, where you have brief intermittent care. So you would have, um, you know, like the surgery and ENT, but we also include things such as uh, traditional healing and comprehensive uh, complementary medicine, such as um, uh, massage therapy and chiropractic care. So th this is some gets to some of the rural villages that we go to. A lot of them don't aren't on the road system. We use a lot of local workforce, community health aides, behavioral health aides, um, um, and support all of this through telemedicine. Our providers are also assigned per village, and so again, it's a relationship. Um, based approach that we use for that, including with telemedicine and including when the provider goes out to that community. So I'm uh, one of the themes of this um, workshop really is kind of the underrepresentation of people of diversity um, within research. And I think it's really important to kind of mention the historical backdrop that might kind of partly help explain um, why this is the case. Um, and I know within American Indian and Alaska Native people, 
um, the his, there's a negative history both within healthcare as well as in research, which um, leads to um, distrust and kind of skepticism. Um, in terms of the um, you know medical um, abuses, um, there was widespread, for instance, a sterilization of American Indian women in the 1970s by the Indian Health Service um, without consent or without knowledge. Um, and then I have a couple of examples of uh, research abuses um, that are listed here and described in this uh, publication. Um, the first one um, was injection of radioactive iodine into Alaska Native people um, with, um, even at that time, what was considered um, not um, appropriate consent. Um, and then the last two examples, um, kind of what is common is that, that in both of these instances, the tribe um, actually approached researchers for help with, a, with an issue that they were struggling with, um, but ended um, up in that uh, process to feel uh, stigmatized um, and that their uh, trust was violated. Um, so the barrel alcohol study led to um, a front page newspaper article that said um, the Inupiaq Eskimo, which is my tribe, um, will be extinct by 2020 from alcohol misuse. Um, and then the Arizona State uh, Havasupai tribe um, case, um, genetic samples were shared um, that were collected for um, purposes of studying diabetes and articles were published on um, inbreeding and schizophrenia. So Donna talked a little bit about um, self-determination in healthcare, and there's been a national movement um, among tribes um, through different acts um, and kind of a shared consensus um, for more and more tribes are taking over um, control of research conducted with, with, their, um, with their tribal members. Um, and there's been a widespread call um, for um, community members to be um, involved, um, if not involved, to actually drive research. Um, and South Central Foundation um, established a research policy in 2005 um, and where they have an approval process for all research. Um, they have a research agreement specifying that um, ownership and use of the data is up to South Central Foundation and that specimens remain in a local specimen bank. Um, there's an expressed um, goal of building capacity within the American Indian and Alaska Native community to do their own research. So 75% of the department that I run is American Indian or Alaska Native. Did I go the wrong way? Uh, this is an example, in, a, in addition to the interrupted time series studies that we did um, about the transformation, this is just a couple of slides of different types of preventive services research that we have done. Uh, the text message reminder um, study was described earlier. Um, one of the things about that study is the comparator was actually a pretty strong um, set of um, uh, reminders for colorectal cancer screening. Um, so the text message reminders were not statistically significant in addition to that, but um, that was an example of um, kind of an applied study that was co-designed with our providers. Um, and um, uh, they were very happy with the fact that although it wasn't st statistically significant, we had more people, a greater proportion of people who engaged in colorectal cancer screening. Um, we've also done some look at um, patient and provider factors that are associated with um, screening, um, so more specifically in depression, and we tend to find that um, American, Alaska Native and American Indian young men uh, tend to be missed in these efforts. They tend to use the health system less often. And then there's also provider variation. So as providers are newer to our system, it takes them a while to really get kind of their numbers and their screening rates up. Um, I also present a couple of examples of pharmacogenetic research that we have embarked on, um, and these are looking at variants which might impact um, response to different types of um, medication, including uh, warfarin. So um, some of the things that went into designing a system that has been successful is actually placing the customer owner in the middle and meeting their needs, not meeting the needs of the providers and not looking at the reimbursement needs, but what are the care needs of an individual. And um, then looking at the entire system of care, every single aspect that you, part of it that goes into health care and changing it as needed um, to meet the needs or uh, meet your mission and vision for health care. 
you know, such as open empanelment, such as um, or open access and empanelment, um, so that people get to know each other. Relationship is really also um, pretty key to this. You know, if people are comfortable with one another, they actually have open and honest dialogue, uh, which helps with care. Data is also absolutely crucial, so that's why we created our own data system for that. And then I'm going to end with a couple of key considerations from the research perspective. So I've described kind of the general uh, paucity of research. Um, and this is really kind of a point of um, tension, I think, between research and communities. What communities really want is immediate benefit. Um, they want to see uh, their family members to uh, see improvements um, in their health. Uh, there's a variety of methodological limitations, um, and some of this speaks to um, issues that are really just complicated. There's diversity across tribes. What works in one tribe isn't necessarily going to work in another tribe um, because the settings differ, the, the culture is differ, different. Um, the acceptability and ethics of certain research approaches is really important. Uh, randomized controlled trials, especially those that involve blinding. Um, if you're really working with communities to kind of rebuild trust, um, that in um, blinding, um, by definition, um, makes that really challenging in terms of transparency. Um, I um, also did want to just kind of talk about um, a couple of other things that I think um, may uh, be relevant to participation of typically underrepresented participants um, in research. Um, one is that I think um, uh, we need to reconsider some of our time frames. So, um, Community-based participatory research has been talked about here, but um, funding mechanisms don't typically allow for that longer kind of startup time. Uh, research also tends to take longer. Um, I know in our work we have to get approvals from multiple tribes, um, and that t takes a while. Um, but there's also this weird paradox, so I feel like I never have enough time to do what I want, but then when somebody like Donna approaches me with a research idea, I tell her, well, you know, give me a couple of years and we'll see if we can start a study. Well, uh, what they wanted, what, what sites want is they want to, you know, start something now. Um, I think there's also issues related to the randomized controlled trial um, that I have already mentioned. Um, and with our health system, there's also an issue of comparator, like what would be our comparator um, health system population um, if we were to try to really disentangle some of these impacts. Um, we have found some um, success with randomized controlled trials at the clinic level because we have different clinics, um, but that really reduces your sample size um, to the number of clinics. And then I just want to end with, um, I also think that we need to um, really take a look at some of those implicit biases that are built into um, the research enterprise itself. Um, I know we've heard talk about standardized measures, and I understand that as a researcher, but many of the measures, when we put them before community members, a, they tend to focus on pathology, um, and so they can feel stigmatizing. Um, some of them don't um, touch on appropriate um, constructs of health that are important or use examples um, that are not really relevant within the population. Um, I also think that um, if you look at um, uh, kind of the types of um, investigators who work within American Indian and Alaska Native um, communities, I know that there is a preference um, within communities to have American Indian and Alaska Native people um, driving their own research. And so really, it's in some ways, it's a research in service of the community. And so you're really judged um, not necessarily on the number of publications that you have or what type of journal you're published in, but really have you established trusting relationships with that community? Does your work make an impact on the bottom um, on bottom line of people getting healthier. Um, and I just thought that was really important to mention just um, so that we um, kind of note within uh, the final report that we also need to um, look at those biases and make sure that we're not going to fund more of the same um, with the same approaches and get the same result in the future. Thank you very much for being here. I'm really delighted to have the opportunity to talk to you about patient engagement strategies and improving health equity within healthcare delivery systems. Great. I don't have anything to disclose. 
So I'd like to start by talking a little bit about Kaiser Permanente Northern California, which is the large healthcare delivery system in which I do research. So it's an integrated delivery system, meaning people receive their preventive services and their inpatient and outpatient laboratory pharmacy services all within the Kaiser Permanente umbrella. It's a capitated payment model. It's not a fee-for-service model. So the healthcare organization receives a flat fee, as it were, to cover all of our members. We also don't have uh, patients in our system. We call them members. Within Northern California alone, there are more than 4 million members. Nationally, there are approximately 12 million, I believe, right now. Uh, the majority of them are within Northern California and Southern California. So within Northern California, in the system where I work, there are approximately 300,000 people with diabetes and well over 600,000 people with prediabetes. Now, the way that healthcare is provided is through a contract-based system with uh, our TPMG physicians. Uh, it's actually antitrust for Kaiser Permanente to actually be the employer of our physicians. So that's something I like to say up front. People often think that our physicians are employees, and they're not, actually. Um, and we've talked a lot about the EHR, and I'll talk about it a little as we move forward. There is an integrated EHR within the Kaiser Permanente Northern California systems. More and more systems have adopted EHRs over time, so that is less of a unique characteristic of our um, uh, system. But as has come up many times, that is really a necessary but not sufficient basis to be doing widespread population preventive services. And I will also say that within Northern California, certainly we have a very diverse population that makes up our membership, both in terms of race, ethnicity, and income as well. We have quite a large Medicaid in our state. We call it Medi-Cal membership. So I'd actually like to say a little bit about the history of Kaiser Permanente, because maybe if you think you know about Kaiser Permanente as a healthcare system, what you might not know, and I think is actually important to stress in this context, is that Kaiser Permanente actually has a history of preventive care and community care that goes back to its very beginnings. Henry J. Kaiser and Sidney Garfield, who was a physician who was working with him back in the 1930s, when Henry J. Kaiser was employing people at large factories, had this idea, how do we keep the people who are working here healthy? How do we keep their families healthy? In Richmond, there is the Rosie the Riveter uh, World War II Homefront Museum, which you ever get a chance to visit, I would highly recommend. It's really fascinating. And it actually talks about how the population of Richmond, California grew, I think, about 10 times its size uh, during World War II to build ships. And people flooded into Richmond. Uh, they brought their families. The community got really big. And this whole idea of what kind of medical care could keep this community healthy and keep people's families healthy was really what part, were really the kind of motivators that started the entire delivery system. So there are a lot of diagrams out there that talk about learning healthcare systems. I chose one that I published with a colleague. And what I'd really like to stress here is that it's very important when we think about integrated care delivery systems, all our care delivery systems, our healthcare system at large, we think about how it can be a learning healthcare system. And I think traditionally, we often, as researchers, we like to think of ourselves as the generators of knowledge and the quality leaders as the end users of what we do. And I don't think we tend to be nearly humble and self-aware enough to realize that actually the people who are working within healthcare delivery systems and, frankly, the people who are working in communities to provide healthcare and work with community members actually sometimes know a lot more than we do. And we really have to learn from them, and we really have to engage. If we want systems learning, we have to engage very uh, meaningfully as part of that healthcare system. So I'd like to talk a little bit in terms of diabetes, which is really my area of expertise and my area of research, about community, family, and social context for diabetes risk. Now, these points have come up multiple times uh, during these last couple of days, and I'm really glad to hear that, because I think that one of the themes that has come up is that you know health risk and the need for preventive care is correlated among social connections. People who are, whoa, okay. There we go, okay. <laughs> um, people who are related socially share environments and resources, they share activities, they often share health information with each other, or have similar health beliefs. There is what's called the zip code effect, or place matters, this has come up many times in the last couple of days as well, that we really know that there's a lot that 
your neighborhood environment has to do with your health and your life expectancy. But when we do prevention research and when we do simulation models and when we do risk prediction models, we often don't take those things into account. We actually really tend to focus a lot more on what is traditionally in the EHR and what we traditionally consider to be individual level factors. And we don't think about family and community factors as much as we should, and we don't take those things into account when we're thinking about how to understand targeting and providing preventive care. So I'd like to say a little bit about some work that I did with some colleagues at Emory a couple of years ago. And we looked at diabetes incidents we, overall and within Kaiser Permanente Northern California. And we also looked at diabetes incidents among the spouses and partners of people who already had diabetes, who had incident diabetes. So you'll see by looking at the blue bar and the orange bar that, again, we have a very representative population. The incidence rate of diabetes overall and among men and women, it's quite similar in our healthcare setting compared to the nation at large. But if you look at the diabetes incidence of the spouses and partners of people whose respective spouse developed diabetes in the last year, it's quite a bit higher. So basically, to, to use myself as an example, if my husband got diabetes this year, my chance of getting it next year or the year after is quite a bit higher. So that really does emphasize how risk is shared and how we need to think about family and communities when we think about targeting risk prevention. The, I guess, maybe complementary part of that study is we took those same couples, the, incident, the uh, patients with incident diabetes and their respective spouses, and we looked at the health behavior change of the spouses and said, you know, if your spouse developed diabetes, what happened to your health behaviors? Um, did, were you more likely to come in for glucose or lipid testing? If you smoked, were you more likely to get a smoking cessation medication? Um, were you more likely to come in for a wellness class? And the answer by and large was yes. We often think of the spouses and partners of people with diabetes as caregivers, and they certainly are, and we think of them that way, but we don't think of them as people who have not only elevated risk, but people who might really be there at a moment of opportunity to help try to prevent. I used to call it a teachable moment, and I decided that's too condescending, so I'm trying now to call it really a moment of opportunity to engage, and I think that's really important. So another study uh, that I did with a colleague of mine, again, goes back to this question of we often just think about individual risk factors and think about what we can pull on individuals from the EMR when we put risk prediction models together. And so we did a very basic, uh, no machine learning, no deep learning, <laughs> really just a proof of concept uh, study to look at prediction of progressing to diabetes among pre-diabetes about, in about 157,000 uh, Kaiser Permanente Northern California patients. And we put age and BMI and baseline uh, A1Cs and race ethnicity into the model, the, the typical things you think of when you think of individual level diabetes risk. And I only show this, again, those are adjusted for all of those other things to show that we certainly did see a relationship between race ethnicity and developing diabetes among a pre-diabetes uh, population. But on top of that, we actually had the opportunity, again, this was, a, this was a test to see if we actually put in some census information about neighborhoods. We put in um, income and education. We also put in census tract level information about the percentage of households receiving uh, food stamps on top of all those other things. And we found that not only was it um, statistically significant that in those uh, census blocks where 10% or more people were receiving SNAP benefits, uh, that it was a marker of elevated risk, but it actually improved our uh, prediction ability as well. Again, not by a lot, uh, but it was really just to say if we start to think outside of the typical risk prediction boxes and start to put in some of these other factors, could we do a better job of identifying who we should be reaching out to? And I believe the answer is yes. So another way of thinking about engaging the community in diabetes prevention or about prevention at all is to think about peers and to think about creating communities among peers and reinforcing community bonds among peers. And this is a relatively new study uh, that I am doing along with Michelle Heisler at um, the University of Michigan. I'm sure a lot of folks have heard of her. She actually really is an international expert on uh, peer support. 
really mostly in chronic disease, though. And so we put our heads together and said, could we actually harness the power of peer support, what we know about bringing people together to help you know, manage chronic diseases and achieve their desired health outcomes if they have chronic disease, and see if we can use some of that to help prevent disease among people who have prediabetes. And uh, fortunately for us, NIDDK thought that was a nice idea. So we are in the field right now uh, recruiting. But I want to say a little bit about that study. There is a peer support intervention. And what that involves is coach and peer contact via phone or text or in person. They start out in person. We are finding very early on people love to text, uh, which is great. I know we've talked about um, uh, some of these kinds of interventions in the last panel. And just, again, very anecdotally, it seems like when people are given the option, the peers and uh, their coaches on how to communicate, they want to text each other, and they want to text each other a lot, which I love and think is fantastic. There's a six-month, uh, um, I guess, defined communication period where we want them to talk at least, talk, I guess I should say in air quotes, communicate at least once a week. Uh, they're often communicating a lot more than that, it seems like. But then there's going to be six months after that. That's a maintenance period where they only have to touch base once a month. Uh, it seems like people are really bonding and communities are being created. It wouldn't surprise me if they end up uh, uh, communicating more than that. And then the usual care arm, this is a pragmatic uh, randomized trial, is a standard pre-diabetes programs and care. And both arms are receiving standard healthcare system and community-based wellness program uh, resource lists, so they can go and do that. Uh, so that's standardized across the two arms. But again, we really think it's the peer support and the creating community that it's at least hypothesized it's going to make the difference. So, um, you know, I was asked to talk about healthcare delivery systems and uh, thinking about community engagement. Um, I certainly think investment in the community, and again, this has come up as a theme as well, is very important. Um, it's not just me <laughs> that thinks that. I wanted to just uh, cite this report from KPMG that really talks about investing in social services and addressing social needs as a core strategy in developing a business case. I would like to take a moment to actually echo a couple of points that came up yesterday about what a business case really means. I think uh, we often tend to just think about it as dollars and cents, but in fact, it's a lot more than that. I think that reputation within the community, reputation among our members and our patients, um, you know, I, the point was brought up about people coming in to an organization that they want to work for and thinking about what's their social mission. There are really a lot of complicated, complex, I think rightfully so, complex ways of thinking about business cases that go well beyond dollars. And I just wanted to bring that up here, that investments have lots of different payoffs besides perhaps reduced ER visits. Um, and I will say that at least at Kaiser Permanente, there have been community investments. I just uh, pulled this um, off of the web. And it was really the, the quote here from Bernard Tyson, who is the national CEO uh, of Kaiser Permanente, that I wanted to point out. And he's basically, he, not basically saying, he is saying, he's saying right there, housing security is a crucial health issue for vulnerable populations. So in his mind, he really is making that link between addressing social needs, um, instability, social instability and needs within the community, and health care. And I think that's absolutely right. And you know, one of the ways to think about that is, again, through different kinds of investments. Um, another theme that has come up multiple times is thinking about the evidence base. And if there are community investments, investments in social needs and screening for social needs, uh, what, are, what are we learning about those kinds of interventions? And the basic answer to uh, quote Laura Gar Gottlieb uh, and her context is, is not a lot, actually. I mean, the systemic uh, review of addressing social needs and screening for social needs and how um, it might impact health care and health outcomes is burgeoning. I think what we've seen is so far is promising, but there's a lot more that needs to be done. There are a lot of research opportunities and uh, certainly we need to be thinking about creative ways to do that. Natural experiments have come up. Um, uh, other methods have come up too. But I think what has been pretty consistent is that the typical five-year randomized trial to do all of this kind of work is probably not the way we're going to build the evidence base as fast as we need to. So I also wanted to say that you know, this idea of thinking about social needs and psychosocial care uh, is something that the American Diabetes Association has started to embrace uh, in their 2016 uh, psychosocial care for people with diabetes statement that came out. And uh, I think that that is very important to point out that this, this idea 
these ideas about community engagement and about thinking about psychosocial needs are um, definitely uh, taking off in the mainstream. And so is population care for prevention. And the standards of medical care and diabetes in 2018 uh, quoted, actually, how population care is really important for diabetes care and prevention. So I do think there is a little bit more of an emphasis on this. Uh, some colleagues and I wrote a paper about a year ago that actually tried to take, again, sort of what do we know from chronic disease and how do we apply it to prevention? What do we know about the population-based approaches for chronic disease care that we have been implementing through the chronic care model and other ways over the years and think about diabetes screening and prevention? And so really just, uh, just to really say that, you know, that kind of idea, that risk assessment, that really thinking about preventive care does need to happen at the population level as well as the patient, clinician, and healthcare system level, that all those uh, levels need to be addressed when we think about preventive care, are really important. And that in terms of actually when people have uh, found to be prediabetes, we do know quite a bit about what to do from the DPP. We certainly know a lot about the intensive uh, lifestyle uh, um, we also know, and I could talk all day about this, so I didn't go into it too much, the forgotten arm of the DPP, uh, metformin. Uh, we know a lot about what metformin can do to help reduce diabetes risk, and we also know that not nearly, uh, in my opinion, uh, very little metformin is being prescribed uh, for that. So again, in that sort of like, you know, where is the field going? Uh, there are new Medicare Advantage rules that are going to be coming out and what these will look like and how they will be shaped, uh, we don't know yet. But I would just point you to the highlighted thing here about um, it, there is a movement towards having uh, Medicare Advantage benefits that can be used to address social determinants of health for beneficiaries with chronic disease, whether that could mean addressing food insecurity, housing insecurity, it is not clear yet, but the fact that that is part of the upcoming uh, policy, I think, is really important to note and, again, add some credence to these ideas. So just a couple of other points, um, and it's interesting how this has kind of um, come up when we think about what can we learn from other fields and what do we really need to be thinking about when we think about a diabetes prevention. Well, in my mind, you really can't improve what you aren't measuring. Again, that has come up before. And this is not an evidence-based review, by the way. This is me going to the NCQA website and counting, um, which is why I don't have exact numbers here. But it is really striking. You know, there's a lot in uh, HEDIS and NCQA around cancer prevention and screening, rightfully so. I think that's awesome. That's, that's not a knock at all. Um, and there's a little bit on diabetes screening and prevention, especially if you, you know, think about things that are sort of, you know, I guess diabetes adjacent, <laughs> um, obesity. Um, and again, I think that's really interesting, um, that balance of what the evidence reviews have shown and what the talks have been about really are much more about cancer prevention and screening and diabetes screening and prevention. But I think most importantly is... When we are thinking about, do we actually have healthcare metrics? Do we actually have national standards around addressing social determinants of health, around addressing disparities, around achieving health equity? Not that I can see. And I actually think that if we want to see some movement in that area, we actually do have to have standards and accountability around it. So is the glass half full or half empty? I will leave that to you to decide. But I will say, and maybe you've caught me on an optimistic day. Uh, but I actually think it is half full. I think that the movement toward understanding how it really is policy and payment that has a lot to do with our ability to build communities and address social needs. I really think this idea around learning healthcare systems and how they really do involve healthcare delivery systems and the broader community. I think a lot of those movements are really taking shape and I am uh, very optimistic. So my recommendations would be that we really do need to think about disease prevention programs that target household and communities. We have to foster patient engagement at the family and the peer and the community level. We have to think very broadly about that. And we have to think about how addressing and screening for social needs and enhancing community resources can help prevent disease and improve health overall. And so these are things that I've really already said. I would just sort of wrap up by saying that, you know, so the approaches here, I really think we can apply to a lot of different types of healthcare systems. I think that, you know, some of my research has been in Kaiser Permanente, but I really think that there are models here that the whole country is moving towards that have a lot of promise. Thank you.
Hi, uh, I'm David Atkins. I'm the Director of Health Services Research at the VA. Uh, I'm in the uh, enviable or unenviable position of being the closer. So I know my uh, job is to uh, throw strikes and work fast. Um, and uh, I know like the scattered people who are left in the ninth inning are, are truly devoted fans and are uh, the people we really depend on to get this work done. So I have a clicker here. If I can, let's see, I'm pushing the wrong button. Do I direct it? Okay, um, so my first uh, job is to acknowledge the many people uh, in VA who contributed to this work. The great thing about working at the VA is you have um, a wide pool of researchers who are dedicated to issues of prevention and health equity including Donna Washington, Michelle Heisler, who we've already heard about, Judith Long. Uh, we have a National Center for Prevention. Some of these people have been at the meeting. Um, we, uh, we have um, the Evidence Synthesis Program, uh, and we have an Office of Health Equity uh, under Dr. Ernie Moy, which is really has its focus on looking at our data to figure out where we have equity problems. Uh, and we have national programs like tobacco cessation uh, at the VA that have been really responsible for much of our progress. Sorry, am I pointing it at the wrong place? All right, thanks. <laughs> I'm obviously technologically challenged in some uh, embarrassing way. So I've been a uh, federal employee for 25 years. Uh, I have nothing to disclose. Whenever I see this, I'm always reminded of uh, Oscar Wilde when he visited the U.S. and he said he had nothing to declare but his brilliance. So um, I really have, must have cold hands or something. <laughs> okay, sorry. Uh, we'll get through this. Um, so uh, for those of you who have to leave early, this is the, uh, what I'll try to lay out over the next um, 15 minutes. Um, and it really echoes the themes that we've heard uh, already from our previous speakers. It's actually not a coincidence that the VA leaders, um, as they uh, were thinking about transitions and transformations to a patient-centered medical home, they actually went up to talk to leaders in the Alaska healthcare system and at Kaiser. And so you're going to be here very... Uh, familiar messages that I hope will reinforce the issue. And that is that a, an integrated healthcare system, especially one that uh, has built a uh, patient centered medical home uh, that you've heard about, uh, can deliver high quality preventive care. And that in focusing on delivering high quality preventive care across all patients, you are able to eliminate many of the disparities that one would otherwise see. However, you won't eliminate all of the disparities, and I'll show you some of the data about uh, what we still have. And that those are especially those uh, disparities that rely on long-term chronic issues um, that are influenced by societal factors, all the things that go on after the patient leaves the healthcare encounter. Um, and that eliminating those really require uh, addressing some of the issues that um, were just laid out for you about building connections into the community to address social determinants of health, forming better partnerships um, with the community, with peers, uh, to help the patients in that 95% of the time when they are outside of the walls of your healthcare system. Yes, ah, thank you. I'll just go with the analog. So um, a little background on the unique aspects of the healthcare system. We're an integrated healthcare system. We provide comprehensive primary mental health and inpatient care. Uh, we are a great laboratory for studying disparities because we can eliminate the uh, often dominant effect of health insurance coverage as a factor. We serve, of 20 million veterans, we serve about 6 million in any one year um, across a national system that includes 172 medical centers, a thousand, over 1,000 outpatient clinics. Our population tends to be older, sicker, and poorer uh, than the remaining veteran populations who don't see us, and in general compared to the uh, average U.S. population. We have a uh, fairly large representation of racial and ethnic minorities, 
uh, due to the um, large number that volunteer to serve uh, in the military. Um, and this is likely to uh, grow because the proportion of uh, racial and ethnic minorities in the current active duty military is even higher. Our population, um, again, due to the uh, people who volunteer in the all-volunteer army, uh, is uh, largely rural. 50% uh, live in an uh, area that would be classified as rural. Our proportion of women is increasing due to the number of women who were part of uh, the Iraq and Afghanistan um, conflicts. Uh, it is up to, uh, was about 7% in 2016, and I think it's up to about 10% now, and will gradually uh, grow. And we have the advantage of having an embedded research program funded by uh, Congress, uh, and have that through the research and through the delivery system have always had a strong focus on uh, equity. So what has VA done uh, as a system uh, to provide a preventive care? The first thing is the importance of leadership commitment. And this includes everything from the top of the system at the secretary level down to our regional, what we call vision directors and to local facility directors. And that's reinforced by a performance measurement system uh, that tracks uh, a large number of quality. These are parts of the performance plans of all of our senior leadership uh, and, of course, facilitated by a uh, national electronic health record that we've had for uh, two decades. Uh, we've incorporated clinical reminders for many preventive services uh, in the electronic health care record, and those have been very effective for uh, the services that are relatively simple to deliver. Uh, we're recognizing that we're reaching the point of reminder fatigue uh, as we load up more and more uh, prompts into the electronic health record, um, and so we're... Uh, actively working to try to figure out how to uh, efficiently use health information technology and team-based care to, to prevent that uh, uh, burnout. Um, as I mentioned, we underwent a patient-centered medical home transformation about five years ago. We spent over a billion dollars in moving to team-based care. That required hiring more nurse care managers, uh, behavioral specialists to serve the team, uh, pharmacy care managers. We've had integrated mental health in primary care uh, for up to a decade, uh, and that's been uh, very important in keeping patients with mental health disabilities within primary care and making sure they get uh, prevention. Um, we uh, increasingly have uh, integrated prevention into specialty clinics, recognizing that the medical home for some of our patients, like those with serious mental illness, may not be the primary care clinic. So, uh, or the patients with HIV. And so we've in, uh, increasingly tried to take services to what those patients see as their medical home to make sure that they don't fall through the cracks. And then for critical programs like mammography, tobacco, obesity, uh, we've set up national programs to really make sure that we are delivering across the system. The challenge a, a system like the VA has is with 172 hospitals, there's the potential, uh, and these, those range from large level one tertiary care facilities, strong academic partnerships, to little small community uh, rural hospitals. Uh, the potential for variation is great. And so you need a national system to try to make sure that we're helping to address that. We're beginning to pilot lung cancer screening. Um, and we've, uh, I'll talk a little more about targeted interventions using things like uh, telehealth and peer support for those places that we know are uh, populations that are high risk and where we haven't successfully eliminated all the disparities. So this is just a quick walk through what we've done with uh, tobacco treatment. It's really a, an analogy of how to tackle a, a prevention problem through a system approach. Um, tobacco prevalence was uh, very high uh, in, among veterans due to the fact that many people uh, smoke during active duty. Um, so cessation, uh, beginning more than a decade ago, was integrated into primary care. It was uh, tracked as a performance measure. There were prompts to make sure that patients got screened for tobacco use, got brief counseling, access to meds. Uh, there were specialty tobacco cessation programs set up that could be refer patients could be referred to who needed a closer follow-up. Uh, we have behavioral health counselors now embedded in our primary care teams who can provide more intensive uh, counseling. 
Uh, we've used telehealth uh, that can deliver in-home in messaging uh, coordinated by a telehealth coordinator. Um, and we took tobacco treatment specifically uh, into mental health and specialty care um, to address the fact that those patients may not be, as I mentioned, seeing primary care. And we, and we recognize the need to train up a cadre of uh, leads to continue to keep this on the, on the radar. And as a result, uh, since um, in the last two decades, we've cut smoking prevalence by 50% uh, in the VA. So let me uh, try to pick up my uh, pace a little bit. But this is just to show that uh, on a national basis, VA compared to commercial Medicaid or Medicare uh, has continued to do very well uh, with high levels of performance on, on prevention, um, high 90 90% for smoking cessation, uh, above 80% uh, for colorectal cancer screening, and then for uh, comprehensive diabetes, cardiovascular risk uh, factor control. So as a system, uh, we're doing well uh, compared to our peers, and that's a function really of all the things we, I just laid out that uh, having a national system, electronic health record, allow you to do. So the real question, though, is are we treating all veterans uh, equally? And are, uh, what are the populations that we want to pay attention to to, to check that? Uh, obviously, we have racial and ethnic minorities and rural and women. Uh, many of our patients, though, are uh, poor, economically disadvantaged. Mental health prevalence is high. And so we want to make sure that we're reaching them, patients with low health uh, literacy. And patients uh, from the recent conflicts where uh, there may be acute uh, mental health conditions such as PTSD. So this is just a quick walk through um, where, where we are in terms of um, uh, disparities. Uh, by I'll, I'll go through those different categories. So in terms of race and ethnicity, uh, yellow is good. These are for 15 HEDIST uh, measures that we talked about. Um, uh, blue uh, indicates places where there is a disparity. So as you can see, um, while we do well, there are some existing disparities um, for black veterans and for uh, American Indian Alaska Native um, that, that we have not yet succeeded in eliminating. Uh, as we look at uh, rurality, we do a little better. That uh, being in a rural location is not a, a disadvantage. Uh, there are some things where we do worse um, for women, and that's uh, largely lipid control. And there are some places where um, uh, serious mental illness. Uh, so what are the places that we have problems? Well, one of them is uh, diabetes control. You've already heard a lot about that. And it's not a problem in screening. It's a problem in providing the continued support uh, to do effective uh, self-management. And so here, higher level is worse. Um, and so you can see that among American Indians and Alaska Native, poor control compared to 18% in white is up to 27%. And it's 24%, 23% for black and, and Hispanic patients. Um, in, we also see some disparities in diabetes control um, based on uh, gender, uh, although we, interestingly, we do not see it uh, based on rural location, and we also see it for serious mental illness. Uh, similarly, uh, in hypertension control, although we do well as a system for overall hypertension control, we still have gaps uh, to deal with for uh, American Indian, Alaska Natives, uh, and black veterans, and slightly smaller gaps, although that's statistically significant for Hispanics. So what are the underlying contributors? Um, these are things that I'm sure you've discussed at length over the last two days. Uh, we do still have issues of trust and satisfaction, although general satisfaction is high uh, with VA, despite what you read in, in the newspapers. We do see a persistent gap in uh, patient experience measures uh, for uh, racial and ethnic minorities. Um, there is a gap uh, in long-term adherence to medications uh, that sometimes leads to later presentation with care. There can be gaps that are attributed to um, health literacy or, or expectations or use of non-medical uh, alternatives. And some of our research um, 
has suggested that sometimes uh, patient engagement in terms of uh, asking uh, questions in their interactions with providers uh, it shows some difference. And as we all have been discussing, the issues is when they leave the clinic, uh, their problems of the social support in the communities they go back to. Interestingly, we do not see major gaps by the facility, so there are not big differences by a, a sort of local culture, and we don't see big differences in how the providers themselves are communicating. So I think, uh, I, I do believe that our clinicians do treat our patients, they obviously have implicit biases, but they really do, uh, are committed to treating all of our patients equally. So I'm going to close uh, in the last five minutes by talking about some of the interventions we've tackled, and this is going to uh, really follow on the presentation uh, from Kaiser, using peer support for diabetes and hypertension control. So we know that we have a gap in long-term control, and so uh, again, we're talking about Michelle Heisler again. Uh, she began work uh, using peer support. Veterans are very uh, attached to their, to their veteran identity. And so a veteran peer means a lot to our veterans um, in the same way that uh, patients may really identify from someone who they feel is from their local community. Um, and the peer provides four important functions. The first is that social and emotional support from feeling like they understand uh, the issues. Th that translates into the value of ongoing regular support uh, and the ability to link them to clinical and community resources, and then to give practical advice that uh, is related to daily management, taking medications, dealing with challenges, dealing with um, uh, barriers that uh, make it hard to comply, uh, to uh, adhere to recommended lifestyle changes, recommended uh, medication regimens. So this is a study that... Uh, one of Michelle's earlier studies on diabetes control using peers. This was in a Midwest community, two Midwest hospitals, um, showing that for while the control intervention over the six months period had a slight worsening of hemoglobin A1C, the intervention had a significant increase, and this translated to about a one point difference in hemoglobin A1C. Uh, Judith Long, an investigator at the Philadelphia VA, uh, did work in, uh, with a more urban population uh, on the East Coast, and again saw that uh, peer mentors had a similar one-point improvement. Uh, interestingly, uh, almost twice as much as one got with financial incentives to try to promote better uh, diabetes control. Inter uh, one great thing about our health services research is we use a lot of qualitative methods along with our quantitative methods to really understand what's going on. And uh, these are just some quotes from our veterans about what they got from the peer, their peer interactions. Uh, you have more time to express your feelings with a coach than you do with a doctor. This idea that you're not rushed and feeling guilty about taking up your uh, physician's time. Talking to the coach feels good, like a friend. I don't mind talking to him. I like that he was a godly man. We had common interests. We were both in the military. It was helpful that it was someone else with diabetes that I could relate to. That's the biggest issue. I know it's common, but I don't have many people, run into too many people who are diabetic. So that's the um, good news. And this is sort of the, like the glass half full and glass half empty. My engineer son says, no, you just have a glass that's twice as big as you need. Um, so uh, uh, we continue to struggle with the issue of overweight and obesity. Uh, and I see uh, a number of the people in the audience were part of a uh, state-of-the-art conference we uh, held I think uh, two and a half years ago on this. And this just shows that over time, the prevalence of obesity uh, and overweight has uh, continued to rise uh, in the VA. Uh, we have a national program called MOVE, which is, uh, refers patients to behavioral lifestyle uh, uh, support, uh, a structured program of advice about physical activity and about healthy diet. Uh, the problem we have with MOVE is we've had trouble. Many patients get referred to it and go to one visit. We've ha the proportion that actually stick with a full regimen of uh, counseling is very small. And so we've been moving into trying to look at the use of digital alternatives, telehealth alternatives, other community efforts that may be more effective than a hospital-based behavioral intervention. <coughs> 
excuse me, and this is just a reminder that obesity uh, is a particular problem in certain uh, uh, groups. It's slightly higher among African American women, uh, those with serious mental illness, among uh, American Indian, Alaska Natives, and uh, Native Hawaiian and uh, Pacific Islanders. Uh, this just shows that, uh, it, however, we don't have a problem in engaging those patients in lifestyle interventions. Uh, this shows that actually um, the subpopulation, uh, the racial and ethnic subpopulations and women were more likely to engage. So we're able to engage and we really are still struggling with how to sustain them into meaningful lifestyle interventions. So I'm going to wrap up now. Um, I think the, these recommendations uh, are nothing new to you. A system approach, which obviously isn't available to everybody, that incorporates performance measurement and delivery system design team-based care uh, can be very effective in uh, providing high-quality preventive care regardless of uh, patient subpopulation. We still need to figure out how to wait, build ways to um, uh, bridge the community and the resources in the community to promote long-standing behavioral interventions. I will close with just two observations. One is that I think uh, we still struggle to understand the value proposition, and that's just as true in a system like the VA or, or Kaiser as it is in a, uh, a fee-for-service system where you're trying to work with payers. At the end of the day, someone has to invest in the change, the system change that you think is going to work, and you need to show the value that is. It may not, I agree completely, that it's not nearly dollars and cents. It's about how can it... Uh, how can it align with your values? How can it improve patient experience? How can it improve uh, provider experience? And the last comment I'll say is I think one challenge thing we've learned is that developing a lot of single disease focused interventions is a barrier to, to that value proposition. People do not want to hire single disease um, coaches, single disease um, uh, programs. And so we really need to think about how do we train coaches that can deal across a range of uh, preventable conditions uh, because it's a, it's, a hard, it's a hard sell to say we're going to have someone who deals with just one of the four or five conditions that we, we deal with. That doesn't mean we don't need systems that focus on them, but the individuals need to be more pluripotent. Thank you. Thank you. This really did uh, tie together a number of themes through the last uh, two days. Let's start with questions and comments from the panel. Yeah, th thanks so much. Um, it seems like all of you are working in capitated plans. I wasn't sure about the, uh, uh, those of you from Alaska, but you're capitated too, basically, correct? Yeah. So. Um, it's it's interesting that all our speakers come from capitated plans and potentially global budgets, however you want to look at it. And um, I wonder if you could reflect on the advantages that you have in that type of a system and how the, the incentives really do change in an environment such as yours compared to uh, what many of us face in the rest of the country with fee-for-service systems. And um, sort of particularly for those of you who in, in Alaska who, had, who did some redesign recently, uh, how did uh, uh, somebody made the decision to organize things that way? Um, and uh, if you could reflect on why those decisions were made, what motivated them, and uh, uh, be very interested in your thoughts about how we potentially get the rest of the country aligned with what all of you are doing. We definitely started off um, with a set budget because basically the Indian Health Service gave us their budget. But then we started looking at finances um, 
with a very different perspective. It wasn't that we were financially driven, but we knew that we had to be sustainable. So we looked at ways to improve that. So uh, in terms of third-party billing, we got very good at that, and uh, you know, billing and coding to actually improve um, our financial um, outlook, so to speak. Um, and then we, you know, with the um, Affordable Care Act and Medicaid, Medicare uh, increases, that also helped. Um, don't know what the future is going to bring, but that has helped recently. Anyway. Um, but in terms of funding by Indian Health Service, it is um, still very poor and hasn't been um, met But in terms of uh, individual needs. But we also, you know, we haven't been driven by the financial impact at all. We do what's best. So like with behavioral health consultants, we've had those for many, many years um, because that was best care uh, for our customer owners. And so we do what's best and we believe um, that the payoff is there because we'll have um, decreased use of the ER, decreased hospitalization. Uh, so we're looking at the whole system of healthcare and how to improve costs for the whole system, not just you know within primary care, because it is a system. I think uh, a a capitated system. Uh, so what the VA has is a global budget that Congress gives gives us, and then it's distributed to facilities sort of based on their patient need. So that allows them to not sort of really worry about who's delivering the service and who can bill for it um, and exactly what is covered. So it gives, I think, more flexibility about designing a team team-based care and figuring out who's going to do counseling without the kind of fee-for-service mentality of what's covered and who has to deliver it for it to be covered. Uh, we're not completely free we, uh, from some of the uh, issues uh, in the sense that provider um, workload is measured and tracked, and so we did have to figure out how to count telehealth visits in provider workload. Um, in the same way that uh, it's a different type of barrier, but in the same way that whether you can bill for a, a, a telehealth visit counts. And so we are um, still tracking uh, to see as we expand new services, whether it's uh, telehealth, text messaging, things like that, um, does that actually replace other kinds of visits? Um, does it add value? Because we, we, in the end of the day, we still have to deliver a certain amount of care with a certain number of, of staff. And so we, uh, even though we aren't paying individual bills for that, we, we have to be accountable. And I would just echo those points that yes, we in a capitated system, there might be some uh, disincentives that fee for service introduces that we might not have to worry about, but it doesn't mean that we don't face a lot of these uh, challenges. Like you said, you might have more ability to do team-based care, but that doesn't mean that physicians might not still be overwhelmed by the number of secure messages coming in, right? Or we talked yesterday about shared decision-making, and I think that's really important, you know, just because there might be different incentives or disincentives to encourage someone to have a mammogram if she doesn't necessarily need it according to the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force, that doesn't mean that a shared decision-making process was engaged in, and it doesn't mean that individual radiologists or providers within the system don't have very strong personal opinions that they might bring to the table as well. Actually, can I just add, um, most of the studies I presented were not incapitated systems. Um, and so, you know, the case can be made as a medical director in a large integrated system, not a capitated system. And if you have economy, efficiency, and quality based on quality measures, those are drivers that systems can help individual clinics accomplish. So th there, there's not necessarily no man's land by not being capitated. You have to be creative and work in, within particularly integrated systems. So a pitch for that. Also, um, the health systems in my state, uh, made a big point to the legislature to make um, uh, telemedicine visits uh, a billable um, visit, and it is in that in our state. So, so there are ways to fix what's maybe a barrier. Thank you. Um, so this is for David Atkins. Um, the 
I find it really interesting what you're saying about rural, that there were not the same disparities that, that we saw in so many of our other talks, et cetera. So you were very clear on saying, you know, with uh, VA, you can focus on um, reducing disparities that you have control over within your uh, agency, but not those in the community, right? So how would you, what, to what would you attribute the fact that, that we're not seeing these same um, rural, uh, rural urban differences that we might expect, even at the same time as you're saying there's great variation across these 172 hospitals and, and clinics, et cetera? So um, I, I guess it depends on, on what the sources of the rural disparities are outside the VA. So in the VA, obviously, a rural veteran, they have access. Um, they may have to drive farther, but due to our expansion of com community-based clinics, uh, they probably can get to a VA provider, uh, even though it may be a single provider community-based outpatient clinic um, in a reasonable amount of time. I think they have an attachment uh, to the VA that maybe other um, people don't have to a, um, another system. So they're willing to, to drive. And actually, we, well, the simple thing is we compensate people for driving. Um, so so that we reduce that financial barrier. If someone has to drive 100 miles, they, they actually, the VA will help um, pay for that. And a lot of the prevention can be delivered at a community-based clinic. You don't have to come to a tertiary care facility to get that. And then lastly, we have done a lot with telehealth. Um, so we provide um, a lot of that telehealth was from a hospital to a clinic if you needed to see a psychiatrist or you needed uh, HIV um, advice about uh, medication or complicated diabetes. Um, but now we're increasingly doing telehealth to home. Um, so I think it's some combination of those things that, um, uh, but it, it obviously, it depends on, you know, what are the, how much of the barrier is. So I, I think we've been able to eliminate the physical distance barrier as a major factor. Um, there may be other community issues in rural communities that um, contribute to those disparities. Thank you. Um, the right. Good afternoon, Chairperson. Do I have permission to just make some general comments from Absolutely. the last two days? Okay. Two minutes worth. All right. In uh, session one, one of the things that I wanted to bring up is the national prevention strategy. Our panelists were asked to make the case for prevention, and I think the national prevention strategy does make the case for prevention. Also, um, one of our speakers made a general comment about the strengths-based approach. I think that um, assets-based community development has been underutilized in addressing disparities and promoting health equity. This approach has been used in faith communities, young people, First Nations, tribal communities, and we need to revisit that and collect a different set of data that looks at the inherent strengths and talents and capabilities and capacities within these communities. Also, we've mentioned cultural competency. We've now ex extended that spectrum to include cultural humility because there are going to still be, even though we want people who are native to those particular communities, we are going to still have cross-cultural um, bridges between our communities. So we need to start incorporating cultural humility training. Also, the other thing that I would like to mention is the importance of interprofessional education for pre-service professionals and also continuing education for those who are in practice so that we can strengthen connection between our primary care providers and our allied health and for folks like me who are trained as community health education specialists. So that's it for comments, and I want to thank all of the speakers for the last two days. And I'm a public health kid, so that's why I'm bringing up some of these community things. Thank you very much. Comments from the group? Thank you. We have a comment from yes. the web. So dental services are underutilized in several health disparity populations. There are several barriers to this disparity, including lack of insurance and out-of-pocket costs. 
Uh, what this person would like to know, they'd like to hear about strategies, about interventions, for example, bundling clini uh, clinical community partnerships in health systems such as Kaiser or others to enhance uptake of dental services. Any suggestions would be appreciated. Um, one of the things I wanted to mention, it was on our slides, but I don't know if we had time to talk about it, is Alaska has been successful in creating a dental health aid program. Um, it was not well received by um, the professional dental societies, but then um, <laughs> once um, they re uh, well, once really people started thinking through, um, you know, most dentists don't want to fly out to rural Alaska to provide care. Um, and so there's a real pragmatic gap there. And so I know the dental health aid um, program has been very successful and there are very clear uh, dental related disparities in the Alaska Native population and so we'll kind of see what that impact is um, over time. Could you say a little, what, what are the services that the aids are able to provide? They, um, Donna can help with this, but I, I know that they can do, um, I think they can do general fillings, they can do, um, they do cleanings um, and fluoride. Uh, I, that's great to hear. I, I wanted to say that at Kaiser Permanente Northwest, they do have dental as part of the services that they provide. That, that's not the region that I'm at, and so I can't give you any data on that. But I do know that at least one Kaiser Permanente region has been doing that. And just speaking for myself personally, I think it's great. I think that it, we're talking about uh, disincentives for fee-for-service and capitated payment and the importance of prevention. I really think that dental health is a frontier in this area that we really should dig into. I know that wasn't the focus of the preventative screenings that we were all here to talk about the last couple of days, but I think that point is very well taken and we can and should do more. And uh, I'll say the, v the VA provides dental services to some of its veterans, but the, it's, it's more limited than uh, medical uh, coverage. So we still struggle with that. And I'll just comment that we we're certainly learning more about the link between dental health and, and other physical health. Mm -hmm. We have a study looking at, um, at uh, dental cleaning as a way of reducing pneumonia, uh, mm -hmm. community acquired pneumonia. Um, and so um, we're, and there have been, you know, sort of, sort of pendulum swinging back and forth about the relationship between dental disease and cardiovascular disease. So. Dr. Parchman. Good morning, Michael Parchman, um, Kaiser Permanente of Washington. Um, thank you, this was a really stimulating session um, and created a lot of thoughts. I'll try not to ramble too much um, here, but it seems like if we're talking about health system interventions that address disparities in preventive services delivery, we're really talking about interventions at the level of the organization in terms of how care is organized and delivered. Um, by the organization. Um, there is a field um, of organizational science that helps us understand how organizations change and learn and adapt and do things differently. Um, and I wondered if there was, you, you have any comments or thoughts about, um, is there relevance of learning from organizational science um, that we could import into our understanding of how health delivery systems change to address disparities and what your thoughts on that are. I'm not going to put David on the spot because I know that there are health services research programs that, that explicitly have organizational sciences scientists in them um, as far as the VA is concerned. So the VA has done work in this area. Um, but I wonder if you, you have other thoughts about um, what we can learn from organizational science that would inform this issue of how we do health system interventions to address disparities. So, so I'll just take a, a first crack. Um, we, we do have some organizational research. I would say it's our thinnest part of our bench. And so I think you have your finger on an important issue. I do think um, it's important. And I would say that the patient centered medical home is sort of the best example of trying to avoid what otherwise is a trap of kind of fixing one problem at a time, and then you have this Rube Goldberg apparatus of someone owns mammography, and someone else owns hepatitis C screening, and someone else owns depression screening. Um, and so I think 
the, the move towards a patient-centered medical home, and it may be similar in, in both of your organizations, was um, in part to try to bring a little more coherence to it. But I, I think you, we still have the underlying problem of how do we make the most of our resources to, you know, to go the farthest around a core set of, you know, high priority preventive care. And, and how do we, who owns the coordination of that? Um, and, and, and so I think, I think we still have a lot to learn about, especially as we get into smartphones and telehealth, uh, there's the potential for even more kind of fragmentation uh, as to who owns that. Because I worry a little bit about, we're already at the sort of stretch, stretching our primary care teams to the you know, breaking point. And if you layer on, now you have to do telehealth visits to your patients and you have to manage the smartphone communication and the secure messaging um, that unless you grow the capacity of those teams to handle that, you're, you, you may end up um, really burning out people. And, and we're already starting to see some, you know, some concerns in our transformation to patient-centered medical home that we're, we, in solving one problem, we're contributing to another. We use best practices <clears throat> across the board within our system. So uh, complexity science was a big thing that we looked at. I mean, we, we always look at, um, you know, what we have operating principles that are based on um, cultural values and what our customer owners want, and then we use best practices and um, layer it over that. So always our guiding principles are, are the operating principles and our mission and vision, but then we use other things. So if somebody has a great idea, we'll look at that idea and we'll adapt it to fall within our operating principles. So we're, we're constantly using that stuff. Um, one of the things that we say when people come to our organization is that if you, you don't like change, this isn't a good fit for you because we're constantly changing. We always want to be um, improving. We are engaged with our customer owners continuously and asking them what um, they want and how to improvement or how to improve it. And based on you know that input and based on outcome measures and, and best practices, we've actually integrated improvement throughout our entire organization. And so we have improvement specialists who are constantly working on things and juggling things and trying to figure out how to do it best. That's amazing. I and mean, this, is, this is the implementation piece of the challenge that you're tackling. Um, and we know half of implementation efforts in organizations fail um, in general. So I'm, 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 I'm excited that you guys are embracing sort of that complexity theory from organizational science into how you do implementation. Um, but I think that's a challenge for research. Um, in terms of how we do research um, on these issues, in terms of putting prevention into practice and addressing uh, that. And so I just encourage us to think about how we might be able to think about the field of implementation science and these organizational science issues in terms of how we do research on this to improve our understanding of how to do it better. So thank you very much. I would just, if, if there's a moment, I'll just quickly add to all of the, the points that you made and all the great points that were just made here is that you know, we, it is true that we're often as health services researchers not, uh, we don't receive uh, training in healthcare management. Those are two different departments <laughs> at most schools and they don't usually get together. And I would just say that in, when I think about learning healthcare systems and the point that I made earlier about how we as researchers have to be humble about how much we have to learn, you know, we're working with healthcare system leaders that actually know an awful lot about how to run a complex organization. And maybe we should be learning from them. We should certainly be bringing the, the best principles of implementation science to, to the field as well, but we also really need to learn from people who actually do this for a living. Thank you. A question to follow on, um, a research question, uh, around engaged research. Um, this type of research that we heard in the question number five is generally conducted at the systems level and while there's IRB oversight, the patients are not individually consented because the randomization or allocation occurs at the level of the clinic or the system or the area. And our solution to that has been to have a stakeholder, hopefully a patient or consumer of the services, 
engaged in the research from the beginning in the classic sort of stakeholder engaged research. Yet sometimes, and I'm interested in Dr. Dillard's view on this, that stakeholder, um, they're often reluctant to say, I represent my community um, because nobody elected them sometimes. You know, we, we found them and hopefully trained them. Um, yet it sounds like in your organizations, that's a little bit different where you actually do have true representation because of the nature of the communities. And my guess is everybody who does this type of work addresses these somewhat differently. Uh, while there is some general guidance and a lot written out there, um, we, we certainly haven't standardized this and I'm not sure it's possible to. I'd be interested in your all's thoughts. I do think you bring up a really good point um, because you know we do a lot of qualitative research too and it's very common for people to say something along the lines with, you know, I'm going to share my opinion and I want to make sure that this doesn't get recorded as what all Alaska Native people think. And so, um, so, you know, people are very cognizant of that. I think one of the things that we try to do is we try to build in the engagement at multiple levels. And in some ways it's really kind of infused into our system because um, over 50% of our um, of people who work for South Central Foundation is actually higher now. I think 60% are Alaska Native or American Indian themselves, and so um, and we have multiple committees. We do a lot of decision making by consensus. So I know um, I talked a little bit about kind of that um, longer startup phase when we have a research idea um, or we take our research ideas from. Uh, from providers or customer owners, we spend a lot of time having discussions um, about, you know, would this be a useful area for exploration? Um, if so, how? Um, and to really get into some of those specifics, and we've asked, um, we've asked our customer owners, for instance, about randomization and like when would that be acceptable or not acceptable? And so we we spend a lot of time, but it's um, it is very um, time consuming. And one of the things that um, uh, we have learned about views is um, of Alaska Native people, it depends. Um, so it depends on so many different factors. And so, um, for instance, genetic research might be acceptable in some instances, but not others. And it's going to be for some Alaska Native people, not other Alaska Native people. Um, so it's certainly, you're not going to find um, kind of this, um, you know, one view. Um, but you're really trying to um, work and find kind of, um, you know, an approach that at least addresses most of people's like major concerns. Um, and, and really, I, I think it means a lot to people. Like we hear feedback all the time, customer owners, like they love being asked their opinion. They just love the engagement process and that really means a lot to them. And they also get that there's compromises. Um, you know, that, you know, the ideal study um, probably can't realistically be done. Um, so, um, so once again, I think that they're willing to engage in these conversations with us about, um, you know, so these are the considerations from our end. Um, you know, you may want to, uh, you may recommend studying, you know, cervical, colorectal cancer, diabetes, et cetera. We can't get that funded. So how could we, you know, we make this work? Um, and then we figure out those solutions. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, okay, thank you. My name is Li Yang, and thanks for your effort in this area to promote uh, people's health and how to prevent it. As a federal researcher myself, I find a lot of problem in the data itself, and then you find out a lot of problem in the, in the government employee on different levels, from the local to federal, and then if you want to see about a global task, you will see all this expansion. And I'm thinking that myself would observe a lot of problem is when the health professional, actually not just medicine or medical field, but also social workers and everything, psychologists, or even the staff, they're really related. I'll give you some examples. They will be misdiagnosis. What I call is really unjust diagnosis. Poor, poor people handcuff and shackle to the, to the uh, health facilities, whether it is hospital, or mental institution or rehab behavior institute. The problem is they use the, let's say, the diabetes, then ask the patient not to eat something sweet, but what they are doing is unjust measurement of, of the 
everything they want to record, but they don't want to give patients a medical record or, or something of that sort, I mean, uh, treatment record. And what they are doing is the timing of, of the measurement and also record, record of the false record. And then they give the patient a very huge ball, <laughs> not necessarily big, and with extra sweet and stuff. And they measured with the timing whether they should be after or before. And they deny the patient to participate all activities as if the patient cannot do anything at all. Thank, thank so you. all these type of things, there's no way that you want to report and get the real resolution. And so they can, they can put patient's life in, in, in very big danger. And they even can deprive our spouse or the children's right to take care of our patients. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Really, if we can work on together, we got to get rid of this misuse, abuse of system. Otherwise, if you want to do research, no matter how good effort, there's always a substitute of false record. Okay, thank you. Thank if, you. Maybe our panelists could talk a bit about the sharing of medical records. Different systems have different customs and rules, even within the constraints of HIPAA, uh, on that about who needs to know what. Uh, and I know it's quite different in rural areas. Um, interested in your thoughts. Thank you for that comment. One of the things that we've um, worked at is having as many tribal organizations within the state of Alaska have um, the same health record. So we, we have Cerner, and a lot of the tribal organizations have Cerner, and so we can actually see um, the medical record from different areas across the state. So somebody who comes in from Nome, which is outside our service area, we can actually see the medical record for that person. Um, and so we, we share um, pretty readily that information basically because it's culturally appropriate because people tr are nomadic in Alaska and they travel all the time and so it's no big deal for them to, to get their care in different areas. So um, we have adapted to that, of course, there, we have all sorts of limits on that in terms of um, like data sharing, um, and then we don't allow just everybody, all the providers in the state of Alaska to be able to access the healthcare system and write orders. So there's all sorts of safeguards that we build in, but the actual um, information itself is there. Um, and then uh, the other limitation is if there's a 42 CFR, um, services, we can't see those. I mean, that, that can be a big issue, and you, you probably all know that as we, you know, are dealing with, um, like, detox systems and um, opioids, uh, and you're not sharing that information, but it definitely impacts health. Uh, you know, there's uh, issues with that. But in general, we do try to um, have as much sharing as possible. I, I mean, I... I if I think one of your points was about inaccurate information, so one one thing we've done is patients now through open notes, you know, can see their entire record, uh, including the notes. And so, if they see something in the record that they don't think is right, then they have the ability to sort of raise that. Um, the other is that we have something um, called Blue Button, which is. Uh, allows patients to download sort of a copy of their problem list and their medications and their procedures so that they can take that if they're seeing somebody else. We, we have a terrible problem with sharing records outside our system, um, and it's, uh, we still haven't solved what should have been a solvable problem of DOD and VA records uh, merging seamlessly. So, so I don't think we've solved, and I'm not sure any system has really solved the uh, problem of sharing across systems, uh, across, um, you know, different EHRs. Um, but I do think, you know, the ability to, br to bring a copy of your record when you are migrating to systems, we have the advantage that the uh, Alaska Health Systems have that we, we have a national record and can easily see care delivered anywhere in our system. Um, but still struggle if, if they've gone to, you know, 
a Medicare, had a Medicare hospitalization outside of the VA and then come for primary care follow-up. That record is probably in some PDF somewhere buried in the electronic health record that a, the clinician has to search through and hopefully find the right, right document. Thank you. I would just quickly say, yes, we face all those challenges that you just pointed out, <laughs> the same advantages and the same challenges. Any last questions or comments from the panel? Thank you. Um, boy, I want to thank uh, all of you. This really was a good summary, I think, of the last two days, uh, bringing it together at the systems level. Um, next up is Dr. Kerry Kabundi, who's going to introduce our wrap-up speaker. Thank you. I want to thank all of you for being uh, an, intent, an attentive and engaged audience. Um, also to, to let you know that we have um, uh, about 100 people who are uh, uh, on the video cast right now. So we have a virtual audience as well as the, the audience that's uh, in the room. Uh, my name is Carrie Klobundi. I'm the team lead for the Pathways to Prevention uh, program in the NIH Office of Disease Prevention. Uh, and um, I am representing the NIH planning group uh, for this workshop. So the planning group had decided to open the workshop uh, with a panel discussion on catalyzing health equity innovations, uh, and then to close the workshop with a uh, keynote uh, speaker who could leave us with some food for thought, uh, some ideas and reflections uh, not already presented um, at the workshop. And our top choice for the keynote uh, closing presenter was Dr. John Ianian, and we were delighted that he accepted our invitation to do the closing presentation. Uh, John Ianian is a primary care physician and health services researcher who currently uh, directs the Institute for Healthcare Policy and Innovation at the University of Michigan. Um, he's uh, actually the inaugural uh, director of this institute which is one of the largest groups of healthcare and health policy researchers in the world. Um, Dr. Ianian has had a distinguished career uh, as an investigator assessing the effects of race, ethnicity, gender, and insurance coverage on access to care and health outcomes. Um, he has a longstanding commitment to reducing health disparities. He has published uh, several uh, innovative and influential studies on this topic uh, in high-impact journals. Uh, he currently leads a team of 15 faculty members at the University of Michigan in a long-term evaluation of the Healthy Michigan Plan, which has expanded Medicaid coverage to over 650,000 uh, adults in the state of Michigan. Um, so I am very delighted to be able to uh, welcome uh, Dr. Ianian, who is going to share with us his thoughts on future directions for achieving health equity in preventive services. So thank you, Carrie, for the warm introduction. And it's a pleasure and honor to be here to speak to the panel and all of our uh, participants in the audience. Uh, it's been a fascinating two days of uh, insights about the, the research that's been done to promote greater health equity. And uh, in my remarks, what I'd like to do is build on everything we've heard over the past day and a half and take us to a, a, a level sort of overarching to think about some of the policy context for much of the work that's been presented over the past day and a half. And I think uh, David Atkins mentioned he was the closer for today's session. So uh, I think that makes me the relief pitcher coming out of the bullpen uh, with the game tied and hopefully help us get to the finish. Uh, so like other speakers, I have no uh, conflicts to disclose. And I want to highlight three themes of my presentation. Uh, the first is to talk about this broader uh, context of the implications of the Affordable Care Act for health equity, and particularly for uh, achieving greater health equity in preventive services. Secondly, I want to comment on some citywide interventions in Chicago and New York 
that have, I think, made significant strides in promoting health equity and cancer screening. And then finally, my third theme is to talk about Medicare Advantage as a model for equity and preventive services. And I think this third theme builds closely on the, the last panel that talked about organizational and systems approaches uh, to achieving greater health equity and preventive services. So just to provide some background on the Affordable Care Act, which many of you may be familiar with, um, it was predominantly focused on expanding insurance coverage for populations that had particularly high rates of uninsurance before the ACA was enacted back in 2010. Uh, one important component was the uh, expansion of Medicaid for low-income adults. A second was subsidized insurance coverage for middle-income adults through the marketplace and exchange insurance plans. And this was built on a foundation of an individual mandate, so the expectation that if people would be uh, offered uh, health insurance regardless of their health, particularly in the private insurance market, that we needed an individual mandate to, uh, to require people to participate in that market. And then there were also important health insurance market reforms. Now, we know since December of 2017, the penalty that goes with the individual mandate, the tax penalty, has been eliminated. But probably in the past year and a half, we haven't seen as much decline in insurance coverage as we might have expected, suggesting that the mandate was useful but not necessarily essential for keeping people uh, insured in the United States. And I think for the purposes of our workshop here, uh, talking about preventive services, uh, the fact that uh, cost sharing was eliminated for effective preventive services through the uh, Affordable Care Act is a very important component of the policy context that uh, all the uh, research and interventions we've been discussing over the past two days are important to understand. So if we think about what's happened to insurance coverage in the United States and how that has affected pre-existing disparities and our efforts to achieve greater health equity, first, if we look at trends in insurance coverage by income or poverty status, this graph shows what we've seen over the past decade since the ACA was enacted in 2010, based on data from the National Health Interview Survey. Uh, so back in 2010, those who were poor, living below the poverty level in terms of their household income, or near poor, between one and two times of the poverty level, had substantially higher rates of uninsurance, over 40% relative to rates of about 12 to 14 percent among those above 200 percent of the poverty level. And we've seen the greatest decline over the past eight to nine years in rates of uninsurance among those below 200 percent of the poverty level, coming down from the low to mid 40 percent range to the low to mid 20 percent range, uh, with smaller declines in uninsurance for those with higher incomes. And then when we think about that from the standpoint of racial and ethnic disparities, Going back to 2010, Hispanics in the United States had the highest rates of uninsurance, over 40 percent, followed by non-Hispanic black Americans, between 25 and 30 percent, and then lower rates, about 20 percent for Asian American uh, uh, adults, as well as uh, lower rates of about 15 percent for non-Hispanic whites. Those rates of uninsurance have come down substantially in all groups, but the absolute magnitude of the reduction has been greatest for Hispanic and non-Hispanic black adults. Next question would be, how is that translated into access to care? Because insurance by itself doesn't necessarily uh, promote health equity unless it promotes better access to effective primary care and effective preventive services. And this slide shows some early work from the Commonwealth Fund, which tracked in national surveys what was happening to racial and ethnic disparities in the proportion of adults, non-elderly adults, without a usual source of care. And what it shows is that from 2013 to 2015, uh, the black-white disparity and the Hispanic-white disparity in access to a usual source of care decreased by about three percentage points uh, in each group, and that's a much smaller decline than the declines we saw in absolute rates of insurance coverage. So it suggests that we're just beginning on the pathway of translating expanded insurance into expanded access to primary care and the effective primary services that we expect would follow. And I think this very much folk, uh, follows some of the remarks we heard yesterday from Carol Mangione, who talked about this, this transition from effective primary care to effective preventive services and how important that is uh, for the types of services, such as cancer screening and preventive services related to cardiovascular disease and diabetes that we've been discussing at this conference. 
So one of the important challenges we face from an equity standpoint is that not all states have expanded Medicaid. Originally, when the ACA was enacted, it was expected that all states would expand Medicaid because there was a penalty states could lose their traditional Medicaid funding if they did not expand Medicaid. But in 2012, when the constitutionality of the Affordable Care Act was questioned and challenged in the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court ruled that the law was constitutional, but the expansion of Medicaid and the requirement for states to expand Medicaid or lose all their existing Medicaid funds was coercive. And so that left it up to the decisions of individual states. And thus, we've seen over the past eight to nine years a wide range of responses among states across the country. And we're left with about 14 states that have decided not to expand Medicaid as of 2019. And I think those are some of the regions of the country where we face the, the, the greatest risk of persistent disparities and the greatest challenges in terms of achieving health equity. And, and that speaks to some of what we heard over the past day and a half in terms of geographic variations and the differences between urban and rural areas and rural areas in different parts of the country, how they're affected by the Affordable Care Act. So that's some of what we've learned about the early impacts of the Affordable Care Act and the Medicaid expansion around the country. Uh, what do we know from some local or regional efforts to address health disparities and preventive services? So this is actually a public service ad that was part of the launch of the New York City Colon Cancer Coalition uh, back in uh, 2003 and 2004. And it was an effort to expand and promote uh, colorectal cancer screening within the city of New York and simultaneously to reduce some significant racial and ethnic disparities that have been identified in that city. Uh, this is a slide from a recent uh, journal article that, that looked at the uh, effect of this program over a 10-year period from 2003 to 2013. And I think what's important to highlight here, when a comprehensive approach to promoting colon cancer screening was adopted across the city, and this included public education, like the public service announcement that I showed, that was culturally tailored to different racial and ethnic groups of uh, adults over age 50 within the city, it included provider education. It included patient navigators, which we heard at, at length in one of the earlier sessions today, as well as expedited uh, systems of care, such as direct referrals and then annual surveys of uh, New York City residents to track progress. So what, what this slide shows is that back in 2003, before this program was launched, uh, rates of colorectal cancer screening were low overall and with substantial disparities. So among whites, they were just under 50 percent. Uh, they were in the mid-30 percent range for uh, black and Hispanic adults in New York City and uh, about 25 percent for Asian adults in New York City. And over this next 10 years, uh, what happened was rates of screening increased for the whole population, now approaching 70 percent. And the racial and ethnic disparities were essentially eliminated over this time period with this comprehensive approach and partnerships between health systems and community organizations uh, to get the word out about colon cancer screening and ensure that as many adults as possible were taking advantage of it. Another example comes from work in uh, the city of Chicago focused on breast cancer screening and treatment. So back in the late 90s, in 1996, the mortality rate for breast cancer among African-American and white women in Chicago was essentially identical. Uh, over the next seven years, out to 2003, that uh, rate of mortality went down for white women in the city of Chicago by about a third, and it went up by about 10 percent. So in a case where there previously was no disparity, within just a seven-year period, a substantial disparity in health outcomes and breast cancer mortality uh, became evident in the city. And here's the value of population level data and, uh, and coalitions of researchers, public health professionals, and health system leaders working together to address disparities when, when they're found in a local or regional area. Uh, this triggered the formation of the Metropolitan Breast Cancer Task Force within the city of Chicago that included each of those major stakeholders as well as patient and consumer representatives. And they focused on access to mammograms which has been a focus of some of our discussion over the past day and a half. But they took that even further to look at the quality of preventive services, in this case the quality of uh, mammogram facilities, and then how that translated into treatment and addressing delays in access to effective treatment after women were diagnosed with breast cancer. And with that three-pronged approach, what we now know from more recent data is that over a subsequent seven-year period from 2006 to 2013, 
uh, the black-white mortality ratio for breast cancer began to uh, return back to where it was back in 1996. Not all the way there yet, but the uh, rates of breast cancer mortality for blacks relative to whites went from being 73% higher to 41% higher at a time when the disparity was actually, by race, was actually increasing slightly across the whole United States, suggesting that some of these efforts to improve access to screening, quality of screening, and then access to high-quality, effective treatments for women with breast cancer uh, were helping to bend the curve in terms of the racial disparities in breast cancer mortality in Chicago. So the third theme I'd like to highlight is what we've learned from Medicare Advantage plans, which are the private health plans that, as of 2018, serve about 34% of uh, Medicare enrollees over age 65, and that's expected to rise to 42% by 2028, as estimated by the Congressional Budget Office. So we've done some work, colleagues and I, looking at uh, what happens to breast cancer screening in Medicare Advantage plans and how that compares to traditional Medicare enrollees, those in the fee-for-service Medicare program in the same geographic areas. And what we found was that the levels of breast cancer screening for women aged 65 to 69 was consistently higher overall in Medicare Advantage plans, and that not only were racial disparities eliminated, they were actually slightly flipped so that minority women within Medicare Advantage health plans uh, had higher rates of breast cancer screening than white women in those same plans. And those disparities and, and, and reversal of disparities was in contrast to what was seen among Medicare, uh, traditional Medicare enrollees in the same geographic areas where uh, racial and ethnic disparities of about 3 to 8 percent persisted uh, for black, Hispanic, and Asian or Pacific Islander women relative to matched white women in the same geographic areas. And then more recently, we've looked at what happens to management of diabetes, hypertension, and cholesterol as a major cardiovascular risk factor among uh, Medicare Advantage health plans across the country. Uh, we, knew, we knew going back to the uh, early 2000s that uh, disparities in processes of care for these conditions, so screening for diabetes and monitoring blood pressure, um, had largely been eliminated in most Medicare Advantage health plans, but important disparities in intermediate outcomes, uh, control of blood pressure, control of glucose, and control of cholesterol, which are intermediate steps on the pathways to some of the adverse complications that we're trying to prevent, such as strokes, heart attacks, loss of vision, uh, loss of kidney function. Uh, amputations for peripheral vascular disease, the, the, the morbidity and the higher mortality that can rise from poor control and from persistent racial and ethnic disparities in, in control of these risk factors. Um, what we found from 2006 to 2011 on the left-hand side of this slide was that um, care improved slightly in terms of control of these risk factors um, um, by uh, race and, uh, for blacks and whites um, across the country, but persistent racial disparities were evident. And those racial disparities were evident in three of the four major census regions, so the Northwest, Midwest, and South. But if you move to the right-hand side of this slide, what we saw was something that we haven't seen frequently enough in the health disparities and health equity literature, which is that at a broad population level, we're starting to see elimination of disparities and improvement in overall control of risk factors. So that by 2011, uh, this slide shows control of LDL cholesterol for African Americans and whites in Medicare Advantage plan health plans in the West. Those disparities have been eliminated, and the quality of care was at the highest level of, of any health plans across the country. And we saw almost identical effects for control of blood pressure for those with hypertension and control of glucose or hemoglobin A1C for those with diabetes. But as we conclude our conference, it's also important to recognize that we're not just focused on improving access to preventive services or improving intermediate outcomes. Most importantly, we want to reduce disparities in mortality and morbidity and improve equity and health-related quality of life. And this is research published in the New England Journal of Medicine last year, which shows trends in mortality for uh, uh, non-Hispanic black men and women and uh, non-Hispanic white men and women within the United States going back to 1999 through 2016. Um, what it shows on the left-hand side is that uh, for all these four uh, racial and ethnic groups, there's been improvement. And in fact, the improvements in mortality have been larger uh, for uh, blacks in the United States than whites. 
but with a concerning uptick in 2016 after a steady decline. So I think this underscores that we need to remain vigilant about some of the most important health outcomes that we're trying to improve, whether that's cancer-specific mortality for people with, at risk for breast or colorectal or cervical cancer, whether that's the complications and morbidity and mortality that arises for people with cardiovascular disease or diabetes. Uh, those are some of the most important health concerns that we need to link some of these improved processes of care that we've been discussing over the past two days with improved outcomes to be sure we're getting good value for the services that we're providing. And I want to close just by highlighting some work that uh, uh, Dr. Richard Allen Williams and I, the founder of the Association of Black Cardiologists, published back uh, shortly after the Health Care uh, Affordable Care Act was, was enacted back in 2010. And we focused on some principles for uh, continuing efforts to eliminate racial and ethnic disparities under health care reform as more people gained access to coverage. And we outlined five key points that we thought were, were essential to uh, continue the progress towards health equity in the United States, uh, to provide insurance and access to high-quality care for all Americans, second, to promote a diverse workforce, uh, to, to, third, to deliver patient-centered care, fourth, to maintain accurate and complete race ethnicity data to monitor disparities in care. And I think we can expand that now with a broader lens on disparities to focus on geography um, and sexual and gender identity and gender and socioeconomic factors uh, because we need good data in order to track whether we're making progress on all the important issues we've discussed at this conference. And then finally, we need to set measurable goals for improving quality of care and ensure that those goals are achieved equitably for all racial and ethnic groups. And, and I, I would uh, make the case that it's absolutely essential, like we heard from the last panel, to bring health systems and more broadly to bring communities into this discussion, as we've seen in the examples I provided from New York City and Chicago, uh, to make that case um, and, and to achieve those goals that are so important to our society. So to wrap up, I, I leave you with three key recommendations from uh, the, the examples I've provided today. Uh, first, that we should monitor racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic disparities and rates of effective preventive services nationally and by state under the Affordable Care Act with this major change we've seen in expansion of coverage. Uh, second, that we should try to learn from large-scale community interventions that promote equity and effective preventive services, many of which draw on some of the specific components and specific types of interventions we've discussed at this conference. And third, we should try to define and disseminate processes that have enabled Medicare Advantage plans to eliminate disparities in preventive services and try to expand those to other elements of our health care system. So thank you very much for your attention, and I believe we have a few minutes for questions if from the panel or others. What kind of um, controls were in there to look at the uh, uh, effect of enrollment, preferential enrollment of healthier people into the Medicare Advantage? Um, because it's an observational study, so you've got to control for selection bias and so forth. Sure. Uh, so that was a bigger issue prior to 2006 when the Medicare program began instituting uh, clinical risk adjustment, which called the hierarchical coexisting conditions, or HCC system. And so what's actually been found in studies over the decade or so after 2006 is that um, selective enrollment of healthier enrollees, which we saw before 2006 in Medicare Advantage, has declined substantially so that with risk adjustment, which basically allows health plans to be paid more uh, when they care for sicker enrollees, uh, has reduced some of those incentives. Uh, and and the, uh, the, the, the clinical profile or severity of illness of people enrolling in Medicare Advantage uh, has come much closer to what we see. And also, as the proportion of Medicare enrollees have gone into Medicare Advantage has you know, essentially doubled over the past decade or so, uh, we're seeing them uh, to be a much more representative uh, group of Medicare enrollees. Uh, so you know, we still need to uh, pay attention to that, and to the extent possible, we try to control uh, for some of those uh, health differences within these studies. Uh, but you raise a good point that, that we need to be aware of as well. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, thank you. My name's Li Yang. Uh, thanks for your presentation. I'm thinking that 
For any program or insurance, they should work for the patient or their families. But I'm thinking that now social program, whether insurance or just a social benefit, kind of like Medicare, Medicaid, or any social program like Social benefit, just social benefit, not just Medicare, and also the Medicare, the, the housing assistance or unemployment benefit. I don't think they are really for the what I call targeted recipients or population. Instead, they use that as a as an excuse, so they, they take all of government funding and they then sort of benefit to a few. So I just wonder if you have this type of study, because if we want to promote people's health or wealth or prosperity or their well-being, we must investigate this. So be sure taxpayers' money go to funding for the benefit of the general public, not okay. just benefit, divert to benefit a few. Thank you. Uh, so I think you raise a point that was touched on in the last panel, the important role of social determinants of health and sort of the role of social services that people with significant health conditions need to, to complement the, the health care services that they receive. Uh, you know, there has been some greater appreciation now within health care organizations and even within our payment system. For example, Medicare Advantage plans uh, now uh, having uh, flexibility to begin to address social determinants of health. Uh, the same in uh, state Medicaid programs, some of them beginning to uh, authorize the Medicaid health plans uh, to, to focus on uh, some of the other social needs, such as transportation, social support, uh, uh, housing and nutrition support. Uh, you know, I think we're just embarking on efforts to implement those, those new approaches to meeting the needs, particularly of people with severe chronic health conditions. And it'll be an important role for researchers and health system leaders and community stakeholders to work together to understand what added value do, does that focus on social services bring and social determinants of health, and what impact does it have on many of the upstream factors that contribute to health disparities in our country. Uh, that maybe you know, if we wait till people need significant medical care, it may oftentimes be too late. Uh, to address some of the, the, the major disparities that affect people's uh, quality and length of life. So I think you raise a good point that uh, it will import, be important for future study. I want to thank Dr. Iyanian. I want to thank members of our panel and all the many speakers who we've heard over the past two days. This was a fabulous conference. Uh, next steps. So uh, for those of you online or here, uh, you still have time to get those comments in. Um, just go to the Pathways Prevention website and um, you can comment on the report or the conference. Um, the panel is now going to go adjourn and we're going to start writing. We're hopeful within a week or two or so we will have a report to be paired with the systematic review, which is now open for comments. You can uh, comment on that online, either through the AHRQ website or in the Pathways to Prevention website. Uh, there's links that work. Um, but our paper will be posted for public comment for four weeks as well uh, during the summer, and then will be published in the fall, presumably, uh, in parallel again in the same issue of Annals of Internal Medicine with a shorter version of the systematic review. Again, I want to thank everybody who was here. I want to thank all the folks online and our colleagues from OHSU who did a very nice job with the systematic review. And especially want to thank our colleagues from um, NIH for hosting this conference. Thank you very much. Safe travels.